I'm Brad Heller with NFL Network Now on the Westwood One Radio Network. The number one quarterback prospect, Caleb Williams, worked out at USC's Pro Day on Wednesday in front of all 32 teams. Bears GM Ryan Poles, head coach Matt Eberflus, and newly acquired receiver Keenan Allen were on hand to evaluate their potential QB of the future. NFL Network Steve Weish asked the former Heisman Trophy winner if his expectation was to be selected number one overall by Chicago. Williams answered by saying, quote, It's not my full expectation. Obviously, things can happen. Things can change. Veteran running back Deontay Foreman signed a one-year contract with the Browns, according to NFL Network insider Ian Rappaport. Foreman started eight games for the Bears last season. New Jets receiver Mike Williams was formally introduced and said he sees a great fit with Aaron Rodgers and feels like the team has a pretty good opportunity ahead. This has been NFL Network Now on the Westwood One Radio Network. Getting your biggest tax refund from Jackson Hewitt can lead to some spirited reactions. Jackson Hewitt, yeah! Jackson Hewitt is so sure they'll get you your biggest refund that if they don't, you get your money back plus a hundred bucks. Jackson Hewitt, yeah! Switch to Jackson Hewitt and we'll beat what you paid last year, even if you filed online. Hewitt, yeah! Ain't nothing to it. Switch to Jackson Hewitt and pay less for tax prep, guaranteed. Proof of prior year payment required when filing. New clients only at participating locations through April 7th. Terms at jacksonhewitt.com. Without the ones like you, who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional-grade industrial supplies. Count on real-time product availability and fast delivery. Call, clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. What's going on? Six o'clock. Good morning from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. I'm Robert Walsh. Last of the play-in games last night, grambling over Montana State, 88-81. Colorado beats Boise State, 60-53. to The tournament starts today in the West Region with Michigan State and Mississippi State at 11:15. You can contract all the madness right here on 104.5 The Zone. And the Vols tonight taking on St. Peter's at 820. Speaking of the Vols, for those excited about a potential homecoming for Derek Barnett, he assigned a one-year deal to return to the Texans. In six games, he compiled two and a half sacks, eight TFLs, and 11 quarterback hits. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and the Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone.
Thursday morning, on Ramon, Kayla, and Will starts right now. And ladies and gentlemen, you have made it into the best 48 hours of the sports calendar. 615-737-1045, how you join us. The madness begins in full today. Round one, or I guess round two, whatever you call it these days. It's changed so many times of the NCAA tournament. Today, tomorrow, all weekend, right here on The Zone but we've still got four hours of radio to do with you, and we will tomorrow as well. We're still working. No spring break for Ramon Foster, Kayla Anderson, Robert Walsh, our producer. I'm Will Bowling, streaming live on 104.5 The Zone TV. It is a great day to hip drop tackle productivity and watch college hoops all day. Good morning, everyone. Wow, that was, a, that was an intro this morning there. Whoa. When have I not had an intro? <laughs> what what a bring it in, Will. Hip drop stomping. I couldn't imagine being hip dropped during March Madness like this, man. And you ain't going to get a 15-yard penalty for it either. Absolutely not, man. I'm here for it. Uh, I will sit around. It was some madness last night. By the way, hey, I'm not even asking. I'm just going to say it, okay? I ain't asking y'all nothing. Can I do this morning? Uh, <laughs> All righty, then. I went on 92Q this morning. I'm already fired Yeah, I was going to say, okay? you've already had a pre-party. We uh, have not yet. Well, yeah, no doubt. Yes. Shout out to Vanderbilt's women basketball team last night. First four last yeah. night. I, what, don't do that, Will. <laughs> no, straight up. Shout out to Vandy's women's basketball team last night. Shay Man, Ralph they put on company. a great display of, of ball uh, last night. And I watched most of it last night. Straight up. Yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah, was. that was good. I, I loved the first game on the plan for the men's Montana State and yep. Grambling State. Overtime, um, wasn't it? It was overtime. Yeah. And I just had a feeling Grambling had already kind of turned the momentum in their favor. Um, they were hot down the stretch and they were down by double digits in that Four game. Minutes. So that was really cool. I, I don't like Montana State either. I'm a Montana fan. So I was like, all right, Grambling State, I'm going for you. Grambling pull, going did, for did you. Grambling pull it off? They did. They did pull it yeah, off. Yeah, it's really cool. Shout out to the HBCUs, man. He's but, just trying to keep in his laughter right now. <laughs> I know, Kayla. So I thought I'd try to you're change trying, the subject you're trying a little. to be a pro on it, Kayla. <laughs> it's almost Friday Junior, okay? It is. It is Friday Junior. Hey. <laughs> All it took was one caller to call in and <laughs> yeah. say, we should be talking Vandy women's hoops every single day. <laughs> Ramon Foster said, bet. Bet. That it. That's exactly what it was. And I, I made sure my niece watched it last night, too. Yeah. She, she's teetering on the on the Vanderbilt side right now. I'm, really? I'm, I'm like, baby girl, come on, man. It's better with the Vols in. What's her What's her thing about Vandy? What is uh, she? They went to. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> it's deep story. Okay. <laughs> oh, did I open up a can of worms? My brother in law is anti Vols, except for okay. anti Lady Vols, because Pat Head Summit graduated from UT Martin, and somehow, well, she plays sport and is local, and so they go to uh, Vanderbilt women's games yep. and stuff like that. So. Uh, it was pretty awesome. She went on the floor this year, got a uh, oh, cool. NIL jersey and everything. So she's in it. Now, I, I like it. I got nothing against the lady Commodores, okay? It's just that we need to be talking about them, and I made sure we brought them up on this show. And you wiped that smug off your face. Well, you hear me? Why are you laughing? Oh, man. I got just nothing funny. against the lady Commodores. This is not what I expected you to lead the show off with this morning. <laughs> we got NFL PA news. We've got Otani making uh, $4.5 million in bets and then firing his interpreter for doing it. There's there's a lot to discuss, and I did not have Vandy women's basketball on the top of the ledger this morning. Changing up that card. There, there I, ain't even, I ain't even. <laughs> this was a good thing. Maybe You're Shohei being a Otani. True fair journalist. Maybe uh, yeah. oh, we're not journalists. Maybe <laughs> Shohei. Uh, I still am. Maybe maybe Otani bet on the uh, the women's basketball tournament last night. I, it wasn't Otani who bet. Oh, no, it was his. I don't know it was his that. interpreter. <gasps> they they fired his interpreter. But you don't think. I don't know. Oh, I, I don't know. Have you seen? So, all right. If you missed it yesterday, Dodgers interpreter for Shohei Otani was fired after questions surrounding at least four and a half million dollars in wire transfers sent from Otani's bank account to a bookmaking operation set off a series of events. So, Ipe Mizuhara is a longtime friend and interpreter for Otani, incurred gambling debts to a Southern California bookmaking operation. Uh, anytime you're describing something that you're paying money to as an operation, probably not a good thing for you. That is under federal investigation. Uh, how he came to lose his job is where it gets interesting. Like it, it, he was taking Shohei's phone and betting with it. Look, I 
<laughs> I don't, listen, I don't. It, it, there's there's video of these two guys literally like this week, and they're like the best of friends, hanging out, laughing, and then all of a sudden, like you're gonna fire the guy the same week, the same day. Yeah. Now it wasn't baseball bets, was it? No. Yeah, I didn't think so. It was on soccer. The the Some only red flag is the taking of his phone. It I just right. having the app on his phone. But isn't that and, that's I feel like that's even more obvious then. Like No. Like, no, oh here, so. I'm just gonna give you my phone. Like, here you go. There's Make your there, If he's his interpreter, there is no reason for him to have Shohei's phone in a sense, especially if he's communicating with somebody. That one I think is it, it's at at the least a red flag. Yeah. I just I all I'll say is that I feel like this is happening with a lot of professional athletes all around the country where they have a person that places their bets for them. I promise you. I just feel like I'm not that's saying obvious. it's necessarily Otani. No, like these guys aren't that smart. <laughs> I mean, honestly, well, damn, like, take that up with Shohei. Jeez. I'm not I'm not I'm not going to say it's definitely him doing it like but like there there are some pretty big red flags with this story. You're not superstitious. You're just a little stitious I'm on I'm skeptical. This. And honestly, that that is my journalistic uh, background is you be skeptics. Be skeptics. And I'm the, I am read this story and I'm a little skeptical. Yeah. That's all I'll say. I just wonder specifically, and, and I get the friendship part. Like those, those guys, and I've been in baseball clubhouses before. Those interpreters are with those guys 24-7. Um and so, yeah, no matter if they've they have known each other for a while or if even if it's just through that baseball career, they become super close. So there is also on my mind a a thing of taking advantage of. and and I do keep that in the back of my mind too, because these guys make millions of dollars, and they do earn the trust of these players yeah. because they are with them twenty four seven. So I do have that in the back of my mind too, that that could have very well happened. but it is it is a very weird situation, very bizarre. To, to Will's point, it's ain't, I don't, it ain't state secrets by anything when it comes down to it. I have seen that that type of motion come around where guys have a guy, uh, may, not in a facility or anything like that, but the conversation of guys being like the general population and gambling mm-hmm. – is a it, it's a thing. That's the reason it's so strenu- like so strong on, on the rules and stuff like that. So strict on the rules is that type of stuff happen. Guys, most athletes have the same vices that regular people do. Hundred yeah. percent, they have the same vices. Now, again, it might just be a dabble situation. That's probably all it is. Hey, what four and a half million dollars is a drop in a bucket to show? <laughs> hey, yeah, for him, <laughs> like, he makes billions. You I know feel what I'm like. saying? Like, like for real, like his endorsements cover that cost mm-hmm. no matter what. And all, sometimes all you want to do is dip your toe in. I, I, I just want to dip my toe in. You see what I'm saying? And it's weird. And you're probably right. It, it's 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 probably both sides of it, and the truth is somewhere in the middle on that one. Yeah, I don't. I mean, look, please don't sue me, Shohei Otani, for saying that you're <laughs> definitely betting on these things. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I, the the radar's up. I don't know. Those guys looked like best friends literally yesterday well, they on were. ESPN. Yeah. I know. I know. I just think this whole gambling world, it's so, I mean, you've got them in stadiums now. You've got, you know, you can place bets in stadiums. It's just wild. And I feel like it's to the point where athletes, because I don't gamble, I don't know what that's like in that world. I'll be the first to admit. So, like Nicholas Petit Frere, right? Yeah. He's a smart kid. He, a smart man. But when he's in the facility gambling, I, I couldn't wrap my hand, my finger around the fact that he did that, and he knew you couldn't do that. Like, well, but he, he still didn't did know it. that. Yeah. But he said he didn't know it. So that makes me think, too, like all these rules and stuff. Like, what do you need to do to make sure they know this is what you can do? This is what you can't do. Period. Well, everybody's do one. Everybody's do a mess up. Like, and the, the get, idea that you yeah. don't know. I mean, I, I believe MPF when he said that. I do tru- right. truthfully believe him. And the fact that he said, probably, I'm not betting on my team. My game's my sport. I'm just right. having some fun with it. Uh, the same conversation be said, and I see somebody say, uh, brought it up with uh, Calvin Ridley. He said it in his OTP, or oh, his own Bucks, uh, Bucks show. show. He was like, <laughs> I was just doing crazy, stupid parlays, and he was. Yeah. He was like, if y'all had to talk to me, yep. I'm not a degenerate gambler. I had time on my hand. I had some money, and I wanted to see how quick I could flip it. Now, what happened with the um, with, with New England's 
wide receiver. Uh, the second rounder that, that was there last year. Goodness gracious, God, what is his name? The wide receiver that went to New England that had the gambling issues earlier this year. Kayshawn Butte. Kayshawn Butte. Now, Butte on the other end. He got the boot for other reasons. He was betting the over on, like, his receiving yards. <laughs> like, okay, Booty, you can't do that. Like, that's just stupid. <laughs> he was, but he ran up a bag, though. He, he he won, like, half a million. I know, but you got to be an idiot to be doing that. Kayshawn. You can come at me, Butte. You call, you call it what you want to. I call that supreme confidence <laughs> right there. Good Lord. <laughs> 615-737-1045. Coming up this morning, we've got Adam Kaplan, who is an NFL insider. You hear him on uh, Sirius XM on Fox Sports Radio, a columnist for Pro Football Network. He's going to join us at 720, and he has had a lot of info on the Titans throughout the past week and a half specifically as it pertains to players they are still pursuing especially on the defensive side of the ball and free agency. We'll get to that at 720. Coach Mack moves back to 820 this morning. Uh, a lot of Tennessee hoops as Tennessee takes on St. Peter's tonight, the Vols and the Peacocks, which you can hear right here, courtesy of the Vol Network on the zone. But when we come back, rule change proposals in the NFL bring up a controversial rule that would hurt defenses even more. We'll talk about it next. It's Ramon Foster for United Structural Systems. I'm here to tell you guys, man, you, you may have waterproof and the foundation repair issues around your home, um, especially that foundation if your house is new and settling or if it's old and the, the grounds get super saturated. The basement ba walls will bow in. You'll probably have foundation issues where there's cracks and there's just a, a, a multitude of things that can go on and can somewhat devalue your home. And that's where United Structural Systems come in, man. You'll have the peace of mind of knowing they will properly correct your house Fix your house and stop those waterproofing and foundation issues. We're talking about sunken concrete or just, as I said earlier, the uh, basement walls just pouring over with water. Those types of things can create a insurance headache. But I'm here to tell you, United Structural System can fix that. They're serving Middle Tennessee, Southern Kentucky, and Western Kentucky. If you have any foundational waterproofing issues, you can reach out to them at USSTN.com or call them at 615-488-7855.
The guaranteed offer is the easiest way to sell your home. It's really simple. We bring you an all cash offer. You close in as little as 21 days. No home inspections, no lock boxes, no open houses. Go to MarkSpain.com to get a guaranteed offer and start packing. RKW is brewed by 8th and Rose to 104.5 The Zone. Ramon, Kayla, and Will with Ramon Foster. Kayla Anderson, I'm Will Bowling. Robert Walsh makes the show go. Just your run-of-the-mill March show where we've started the show talking about baseball and college women's basketball. Yeah. It's a normal day. It's just a normal day, man. All right, the, uh, the specifics on this Otani thing, by the way, I don't think the interpreter stole his phone. I want to make sure I get the facts right, a.k.a. Otani. Again, please don't sue me. <laughs> I'm joking, but Allegedly. no, it's uh, apparently Otani agreed to pay his debts for him after yeah. learning how much he had accrued. But mm -hmm. that is one of the conspiracy theories out there. It's just that, like, well, did this guy just like steal his phone or something? So anyway, Ooh, interesting sticky, stuff. Sticky situation to start off the MLB year in Korea. In which yeah. literally there's a game going right now, and we're going to rant about that in about 20 minutes because I think that's completely ridiculous. But anyway. That's a story for uh, 6.45 this morning. Uh, Ramon Foster, hip drop tackles. <laughs> There's a chance they could be 15-yard penalties. How do you feel about that? Not a fan of them. <laughs> I am not. I understand what they do. To me, it's similar, very similar with um, the horse collar. Uh, you get that ankle trapped underneath the way they do it sometimes, and I don't know if there's a right or wrong way to do it, but we, I've seen guys get hurt, get their foot stuck underneath, that leg stuck underneath, and I've even seen it where guys have them, the guys still somewhat up, and then other people pile up on them, 
And then you have the ability of, of, of breaking somebody's leg or ankle snapping or something like that. I personally do not like it. I'll be honest with you. Um, but I know the defense. The defense is harder and harder and harder and harder for them to play football a very proper way. Um, I know you tell them the gator roll. There's other alternatives to it. But that that one particular play, and we'll have Ryan Clark on tomorrow. To this, I'll I'll make sure to ask him how does he feel about the hip drop, um, because I've seen especially smaller defenders defend that technique right there, because offensive guys are bigger sometimes than them, and it works. It really does work well. I always wonder with the changing of rules, and and look, I am all about preserving somebody's body someone's you know mind we've we've seen cte and the effects of that um you know along the years so i'm always i'm always up for new things to help safety but i would think it would be extremely hard especially for those defensive players who have played ever since this has been legal and this is what they fundamentally know and what they grew up learning about the game is being a defensive player and knowing like, okay, we can do this. This is fair. Like this is a part of the game. And so when you start taking all that stuff away, which I agree, it's, it's, it it is dangerous. And there's a lot of things that can come out of something like that in terms of an injury. It's just got to be so difficult though, if you are a player in this day and age and I can see the future players, if you know, like that will be something you cannot do in the NFL. Like, you can prepare for that if you are a younger player, you know, still kind of learning all the fundamentals and everything before you get to college and all of that. But for some of these players that play and have played for years, it's got to be so tough on every play to be thinking, just do your job first and foremost. But now, you know, there's limitations to how you can do it. Um, I'm not excusing it and saying, you know, it's okay to do, but it's got to be difficult to manage that okay, I'm going to be a defensive player and give it my all and be that nasty, you know, guy, but I also got to remember I can't do this. I can't do that. Uh, The quarterback hit, and I've seen some questionable calls on the quarterback hits too, which I don't agree with, which shouldn't be called. So let's just be consistent at least if we do make these rules. The the thing about the hip drop to me is it's fairly new. Is, is more prevalent now than I've ever seen it be. I think players have somewhat mistakenly done it in, yeah. in the years past and stuff, but now it has become an actual technique that is used by certain teams. And it's mostly where well, I've seen it from secondary guys or linebackers. I hadn't seen a big do it, anything like that. And, again, I think it has – it's the swing around and full body weight. I, I saw the rules of it is unweight yourself. Go ahead, Will. Yeah, the committee's attempt is for officials to note two actions in one tackle. If a defender, quote, grabs the runner with both hands or wraps the runner with both arms – according to the wording of the proposal, and also, quote, unweights himself by swiveling and dropping his hips and or lower body, landing on and trapping the runner's legs at or below the knee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the trapping of the legs that get you. Mm -hmm. It's the same way the horse collar has been outlawed, too. And you pull them, and you can pull them to the ground and trap them. Like, you can roll – you basically rolling your body underneath them – and that's where it sucks to me. Yeah. Again, I guess as long as you're not dropping down and removing your body from, I mean, your legs from the ground, you're capable of doing it because the gator roll to me, I think, works as far as grabbing a guy and rolling yeah. him over and stuff like that or hold him up until your teammates come over there and start to tattoo him. It's, it's one or two things that have to happen. But being a fan of this one particular rule, and we've seen guys have injuries from it, go to IR or either have that. Y'all have been playing sports and have that initial like, oh, my God, like that moment right there. I've seen dudes have that initial scare because their foot and or ankle or leg gets trapped underneath it. Can I ask real quick then, why why did it kind of, I guess, segue into this type of a tackle for specifically like you're seeing more of the linebackers, cornerbacks? Was it because they were trying to cheat a little in terms of not having the upper body hits? Like, I just am curious to where that 
yeah. um, really came from. I, well, it's, it's attack the legs. The thing about it, you see DBs right now, and I, I use that group because they use this technique most often, I think. They attack the legs, mm-hmm. and sometimes they'll hit the legs and guys will run through them. Yeah. And, and, and then the other side of it is the, the gator roll. Like, you can hit a guy and try to roll their legs over, and I think if eventually guys have have seen, if I grab them and yep. drop my body on them, then you can't move anywhere. I've seen it happen before in, like, Little League before, not realizing that was the case. Ever seen the big kid run the ball? Sure. And then kids grab onto them and try to fall to the ground? Like, they do that, except that the kids are that much bigger at a younger age. These are grown men that actually lift, that actually have strength, and they've found a way to swing their body into bringing you down. Yeah. I do think it's in the correlation of not trying to hit guys up top. But most DBs don't hit guys up top anyway. This is not a DB issue. Yeah. It's just that they use it, I feel like, most often than anybody else. More often than anybody mm-hmm. else. Doesn't it just feel like we're taking away another avenue for a defensive player to do his job? I don't like it. I really don't. Because you can't go high. In this context, you can't go low and swing a guy around. How are you supposed to get some of these running backs and wide receivers in open space on the ground? Like they have in years before. Just don't do the hip drop. My thing is, is go up. See, that's the thing, too. Is and this get this is is so much context and just this is a bigger dialogue than I think it is, also. But the game is in space more than it ever has been before. And you take away the physicality of just saying, well, we see even now running backs run out of bounds. We see now guys will just try to grab on and hold on to somebody else comes up. But I think the, the, the athlete in itself, being in space, breaking guys down, shaking somebody is just totally different to where if I can shoot the hips, which is what they tell you, shoot the hips and, and get them and roll is what you do to get them on the ground. But this has just added differences to guys being bigger, faster, and stronger to me. Do you trust officials to make those mm. two snap decisions in an instant and correctly adjudicate this rule? Well, I trust them. Now, I think they're going to overdo it anyway yep. just to stop it. Yep. Do I trust them? No. That's the thing. Like yep. if, you're, if you're requiring officials now to make two snap decisions of – are you grabbing the runner with both hands or wrapping the runner with both arms and unweighting yourself by swiveling and dropping his hips and or lower body landing on and trapping the runner's legs at or below the knee? It just feels like the first time that that is called against someone who isn't making a hip drop tackle, we're going to be livid. Like imagine a <laughs> third and 15 and a screen pass and there's a clean tackle, but one side judge thinks that you trapped yourself a little too much on the defender's legs or on the on the runner's legs and you're throwing a flag for it and it's an automatic first down on the third and yeah. 16 screen pass. Like, that to me is what I think is going to happen more often than not. Well, it's a detailed motion too. I mean, like, there's a lot to that, right? And I think you're right, at least in, for the beginning of if this rule gets put into place, we are going to see some of those calls that are going to be different and we're going to get angry because again we're just seeing the quarterback hits and some of those are clearly in my opinion not quarterback hits um pressures yes but I think I've been irritated a number of times last season seeing that and saying why can't we just see some consistency and I think that's more point blank to to be able to say hey that is a hit that is not the uh the thing is guys will and should adjust the issues that i have with it is is when you see guys um break their legs get them snapped like that right there is going to cause more delay than us actually having a referee stop i mean give you a 15 yard penalty when you got to clean up a mess on the field because somebody's leg got snapped to me i think this is probably one of the more serious tackling techniques that need to be taken now I'm not uh, again. I, I I'm I'm not opposed to playing the game physical. The mm-hmm. g- football game will always be a physical game, but to remove this one, it's the same thing as uh, seeing the game be removed. Uh, seeing the horse collar tackle being removed too to me. If you're gonna do this, then I think the way to do it is to have replay assist that we see the NFL use in the playoffs. Have somebody in the booth take care of this call, sure specifically. And if you want to radio down and overturn or confirm within 10 to 15 seconds a hip drop tackle, that's fine to be. But 
then you get into the Pandora's box of, well, how much do we really want to lengthen the game just to make judgment calls on the field? Because then if you're having replay assist help you with a hip drop tackle, then can they confirm or deny roughing the passer and things of that nature? It's an interesting conversation. I don't think there's one right or wrong answer to it. And you look at guys like Tony Pollard, who specifically were hurt on this exact kind of tackle. Like you can make the argument that this is just as dangerous as a guy that goes high and tries to hit you in the upper body in terms of the long-term impacts of a leg injury or a fracture or a break within that context. So I, I think it's interesting. I do think on the other side, the proposed kickoff rules I'm a fan of and going to the XFL way of life because the kickoff has pretty much been eradicated by Roger Goodell in the NFL. And now you might have a way to get it back. Yeah. Um, and, and one more thing before we go to yeah. the kickoff real too. It, it, so the uh, hip drop came about in 2022 postseason. It says when Jimmy Ward oh, snapped so was, uh, Tony oh, Pollard's right. leg in the playoffs yeah. and says since then the NFL's injury data has shown that the hip drop tackles increase the risk of injury by 25 times the injury rate of a standard tackle. Was this talked about when you were playing? Like, when did this conversation begin? This wasn't a thing. Really? See, not, then it not was the hip recent, drop. huh? I never saw the hip drop, ever. I, we Gator roll is what you do. Hit the hips, yeah. hit, hit the hips and roll them. That's what it was. It it's was, almost like it mutated yeah, into what it is now. It says 2022 yeah. is when it happened with Jimmy Ward. That's crazy. As far as it being more prevalent then. Yeah. I don't remember it while I was playing. I never heard the technique be used. I'd be really curious to get Pollard's take on that. I'm sure he hates it. I'm sure he Man, hates bro, it. He he is the case. Yeah, that's what we were saying. Is like, no, yeah. I just I'm, I I would love to hear him talk about it. You know, in yeah. Terms of that's kind of where it, it it made its first showing. It's just interesting. I, I feel like people were. It, it it is hard for me to believe, and I'm not. I don't like think you're lying to no. me. Obviously, but it's just hard for me to believe that this happened for the first time in 2022. I don't remember it being a thing like this. And I, I get it. I believe and, it. And, and again, I play offense. So right. <laughs> I right, never right. saw players have that discussion. It's just interesting that this became such a thing so quickly. I'm going to get a defensive perspective, too, at some point. Just to- well, we've got Ryan Clark on tomorrow at 912. Yeah. Yeah. on tomorrow. And I think he'll probably take the other side. Yeah. But he's been the super advocate of the game he being has. taken away from sure. the defensive players. I agree he with has. him. I, I saw a clip recently of Ryan Clark cleaning somebody's clock. Yep. And people celebrated. The yep. game stopped. That's how football goes. Right. And then, of course, you bring in health and safety and helmets and concussions and stuff like that. You change the game. And I'll be real with you. It's some stuff that was just over the top. I do not believe in the gangbusters when it comes down to kickoff coverage and having offensive linemen lock arms. And then you got a guy that's torpedoing into them. Can we? That was probably yeah, our. right. No. That was insane. And Ryan has talked about that, too, I know, of like, don't glorify hits that I made like this that I regret, too. Because the the segment of you got jacked up and all these things that like we do sometimes on social media, like Ryan is one of those guys who was making those hits who doesn't like it being replayed. Mm-hmm. And he's talked about that at length on the record and on television and on radio of like, no, nah, I was an idiot <laughs> for lack of a better term. And he had to, I, I, I hate to say he had to go that route, but he did have to go that route. Sure. To be relevant yeah. in the game, yeah. to, to, to play a style of ball that was physical. And and he said this time and time again. Uh, he said he had defenders come up to him. And we can ask him about this since we're talking about the, the, the health and safety. He said he's had wide receivers come up to him after seeing those hits and tell him, Ryan, I'd much rather you hit me in, up top in my shoulder head oh. area. Then it hit me in the legs. That's interesting. Right. He's yeah. this has been said. I'd much rather you hit me up up top than to end my season by tearing my knee out. Sure. And and it's it's it is hard to play defense these days. It is one of those situations where guys have to be cautious. And I do think they're overprotecting the quarterback. If I tap your helmet and not egregiously hit you in the head, I don't think that should be a penalty. Mm-hmm. I don't think if I fall on you full body weight that you should be um, that I should be penalized for sacking you and me not having good enough grace Mm -hmm. to not fall on you full weight. I think that is soft. I think that's something that should be given back to the defenders. But I don't like I don't like engaging cuts. I never was a guy that cut guys on cut blocks and stuff like that. 
as women one of my things, but I'm also not a guy. I'm also a guy that hates the peel back block. And I've done that. Yeah. After watching it on tape, that is a filthy. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about a filthy block. When a guy is running down the field on the interception and you got defenders, Warren Sapp, I think is probably one of the most famous ones. He peels back, I think, on a Jets player and completely cleaned his clock out. And I'm thinking to myself, that is just a nasty, filthy play. Steven in the Effin and Bank Chat on YouTube makes a good point in uh, looking at the picture of it. He's 100% right that the broken leg that Delaney Walker suffered in Mike Vrabel's first ever game as head coach of the Titans in the in 2018 was a hip drop tackle. Was it? Yeah. yeah. I'll have to go back and look and at And looking that. at the picture right now, it was. The defender's grabbing his left hip and is falling on his right ankle. And that's essentially the end of Delaney Walker's career as a Titan. Yeah, it was the longest game in NFL history in 2018 down in Miami. I I, I do think this became more of a thing recently, as high hits were taken out of the game and defenseless receivers and that vocabulary was introduced and made mainstream for NFL players. But I do think this has been happening mm-hmm. forever, just not at the level it has now. Six one five seven three seven one zero four five. We'll talk about the kickoff proposal and the stats on how it could really help reintroduce a very interesting element of special teams that's essentially been taken away by the NFL. Next.
RKW is brewed by 8th and Rose to 104.5 The Zone. Ramon, Kayla, and Will. 615-737-1045. How you jump in? The NFL is taking a page out of the XFL's book, and you might see kickoff returns return to National Football League games. The NFL's competition committee pro- proposed a revamped kickoff on Wednesday that resembles the alignment used in the XFL during its 2020 and 2023 seasons. So this would be the most significant rule change the NFL has had in a long time, and if approved by at least 24 of 32 owners, the rule would go into effect for one year. So essentially, guys, you have a kicker who would continue to kick from the 35-yard line, but the other 10 players would line up at the receiving team's 40-yard line. At least nine members of the return team would line up in a, quote, setup zone between the 35 and 30-yard line. Up to two returners can line up in a landing zone between the goal line and the 20. No one other than the kicker and returners can move until the ball hits the ground or a player inside the landing zone. Touchbacks would be marked at the 35-yard line and no fair catches would be allowed. How do we feel about this? I love it. I do. I do. I, I legitimately love this. You add excitement to it. It takes the impact away from it. And, and it's somewhat, I'm going to be real with you, take me back to like backyard football almost a little bit. Like, like toss them up, bust them up. Like, that's what you're getting in, in these situations right here is, hey, put your best athletes out against mine and let us go and have a day at it. I am all for this, man. But what it will do is, the crafting of rosters would be a whole lot different because you got to be able to have guys that can actually go make plays in these moments against the type of athletes you can put back there. And I do think with the impact somewhat taken away from the initial kickoff side of things, I do think you'll probably see more premier players back there, like dudes that we've wanted to see kick returns, but it's too dangerous for them. Um, I'll just throw a name, like an Odell that may be very dynamic in a return game, or you have this type of wide receiver that's capable of doing these type of Zay Flowers may be back there because you've taken the impact away from uh, the long run down the field on the tackle. I'm a fan of this one. Man, it's one of my favorite parts of the game that I haven't said has been a favorite part of my game in so long because it has been taken away. You just don't see those, you know, run it down for 67 yards and a touchdown on the, you know, the kick return. I mean, that was some of the most fun football and some of the best athletes that you saw back there doing it. You saw Devin Hester, one of the best to ever do it. I'll keep it right here close to home. Uh, Mark Mariani, who did it at Montana who was incredible who really like made a career here and was a a rookie uh this I think when he was in his rookie season he made the Pro Bowl because he was so incredible at the return and unfortunately he got hurt Ah. on a return too but it was just those memories that I had that were so fun about watching the game as a specialist because they are some of the most awesome athletes that are back there doing it. And it makes the game that much more fun to say, hey, we could score on this. We could score on a return. So the the interesting thing about this is that touchbacks would bring the ball to the 35-yard line. That's the thing that I think we're we're missing and glossing over because it's literally incentivizing you as a kicker to kick it between the goal line and the 20 and make guys return it. Mm -hmm. Because now if you just boot it through the back of the end zone in a way that's just, all right, let's just get rid of it and uh, not try to set up any kind of return, then now the team gets basically an extra first down Mm -hmm. than they would have otherwise. So I think for the Titans, actually, having Nick Folk now kick shorter actually might be more in your favor because no longer is there a need for a kicker with a strong leg to just boot it through the back of the end zone and never give up a return, you're going to essentially have to give up returns. The reason why this is a thing is because in the XFL, they did this. They want to take away injuries of the fast collisions happening between return teams and, um, you know, the, the wedges that are setting up to block and things of that nature. So in the XFL, more than 90% of kickoffs were returned during the XFL's two seasons. The touchback rate dramatically increased 
over that period in the NFL. Last season, 21.7%. 21.7% of kickoffs were returned in the NFL. 90% of them were in the XFL. So now you can't fair catch it. If the ball lands in the landing zone between the goal line and the 20, it has to be returned no matter what. It's bringing in an extra element of strategy because if you kick it through the back of the end zone, you're giving the other team the ball on the 35-yard line. And for some teams and the kickers they have, you are essentially already 15 to 20 yards away from field goal range if you're playing a team like Baltimore. Oh, facts. facts. 615-737-1045. Braden in Shelbyville leads us off on the phones this morning. Go ahead, Braden. Good morning, guys. How y'all doing? Good, Good morning. morning. So I got a question for everybody first off. I looked it up. Does anybody know how many career tackles Ramon Foster has? <laughs> uh, well, Robert just told me in my ears, so I will abstain. I probably have two. Add eight to it, and you're right. You had ten, and get this. Ooh. You had zero assists. You didn't need any help. Look <laughs> at that. Expert. Two-way player, baby. Those are some stats That's right there. <laughs> so, out of the ten tackles that you had, can you explain or, you know, go into detail on your Biggest or most favorite one? Appreciate it, guys. Uh, you, probably Brandon. South Carolina on the interception. Ooh. I somehow found speed. I don't know. <laughs> I found speed. It's the game that I hate the most. And South Carolina did like a whiteout, I think, at their place. It was a night game in you South Carolina. You talk about that a lot. Because that game yeah. was my I, – I never knew Columbia was like that. I did not. And that game was just one of those just hit you in a whirlwind. It was that one because I chased the guy down before he went into the end zone. That's pretty dope. Yeah, that was solid, right? 615-737-1045, our number, our number two begins when we come back. A little bit of SEC scheduling news in a way that it resembles the way college football used to be when one Ramon Aloysius Foster was playing. <laughs> That's next.
<laughs> What's going on? 7 o'clock. Good morning from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. I am Robert Walsh. Last of the play-in games as the madness fully envelops us. Grambling over Montana State, 88-81. Colorado beats Boise State, 60-53. Both of them into the big dance. The tournament starts today in the West Region, Michigan State and Mississippi State at 11:15. You can contract all the madness right here on 104.5 The Zone. The Vols take on St. Peter Peacocks tonight at 8:20. And for those excited about a potential homecoming, Coming for Derek Barnett, don't hold your breath. He has signed a one-year deal to return to the Texans in six games last year, compiling two and a half sacks, eight tackles for a loss, and 11 quarterback hits. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your own for the Titans and the Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Hour number two, beginning the best 48 hours of the year. Welcome to March Madness. And welcome to 7 a.m. on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. RKW is brewed by 8th and Roast with locations on Charlotte, 8th Avenue, the airport, and the Broadview at Vanderbilt. 8th and Roast Coffee cultivates community by the cup. And our community includes Ramon Foster, Kayla Anderson, Robert Walsh, our producer, and myself, Will Bowling. Coming up in 20 minutes, NFL insider Adam Kaplan will stop by. He's got notes on Pro Football Network about two Titans free agent signings and what the league is saying about Lloyd Cushenberry and Tony Pollard specifically. It's some interesting things that come along with that. Streaming live on 104.5 The Zone TV, Facebook Live, YouTube, Twitter, or Twitch. Twitch, please. please. And as late as over hell. the next couple of days... We are the only ones who say Twitch, please, because Mm -hmm. it is us and it is Buck Rising. And then it is Westwood One coverage of the NCAA tournament for the next two days. We're your only full show. So get it while it's hot. We're We're not complaining. Remember, Ramon? You're not surprised by this. You knew this was the case. We're going to take it and we're going to grab it by the you know what. No, we get to come to work. We get to talk about sports for four hours a day. We've got good. Do they still get paid? Probably. I don't know. Ask well, your brother. That's a get, great question. They can give. Yeah. They're paid to us, so we get double time. No, right. no. Nah, nah, I, mean, I mean, straight up. We've got it. We've got it easy, guys. We get to come and talk sports for four hours a day, and then that's our job. Do we get breakfast? We're the only one working. If, if you want to buy some, I'll no, take not breakfast. me. I'm just asking other people no, out there. No. If you want to volunteer breakfast? Oh. We don't know one's working. Everyone looks at her. Speaking of, I went Who's to, got it better than us? <laughs> I, I went Nobody. to Loveless yesterday, so maybe someone can order some Loveless yeah. Cafe. I, I mm. think they Uber here. Biscuits? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Throwing it out there. Oh, me, oh, my. Anyway, you if you need told me that. any kind of Titans reaction or uh, NFL free agency discussion over the next 24 hours, just come here to us and yeah. then stay after that. It'd be yeah. great. Listen to the games. I'm going to take a second to reset. <laughs> I, Do you need to walk out the door? You knew that we were I, the only full show on the next I day. We forgot quickly. And I talked to Savage yesterday, too. And he was like, I got a little vacation. I was like, wait, okay, yeah, yeah. And it didn't register to me because I was mm-hmm. in dad mode at the time. Sure. Okay? And now I, I realize that, yeah, you're right. We only ones in here. Did y'all ever have to go to summer school? Never I did. did. In college, <laughs> Yeah, you know, my dumbass did, too. I did. Uh, so, I'm hey, the only one that didn't. This nice. feels like summer school to me when all your friends are like, oh, yeah. man, I'll be watching the games and we go into a bar, checking out. It's like, oh, man, I've got to... I got to retake trigonometry. I, I, Couldn't trigonometry. I, I just wanted to make sure my credits were good. I was so scared, like, oh. that I was not going to have enough credits. I was weird about that stuff. And plus, it was a party during summer school. Couldn't be my transcripts. Mm. Nah, mine was iffy because of geometry. Oh, high really? School, yeah. Oh, yours was high school. Okay. Yeah, mine was high school. I thought I was hot stuff at the time. And that's why I'm on my kids about their grades all the time. Because one little slip up, baby, get you a D. Come on, Ramon. Geometry. Quit being so obtuse. You knew geometry. Oh, I should throw this full bottle of water at you. <laughs> you already got me. Is it a kid? Uh, yeah, that, that, I thought oh, I took it from a, a good angle. Cute. Oh, that's what we're doing now, huh? All right. Okay. You can't always be right, Ramon. Mm. I think we've covered every angle now. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> 
Let's take a 90 degree turn and talk a little bit of college football. <laughs> I hate y'all. I do every single one of y'all in here, okay? Let's let's talk college football. But let's go to Philip in Hendersonville first. 615 737 1045. Hey, Philip. Hey, guys. Good morning. Good morning, morning Phil. Good. I don't know if y'all can hear me well. Oh, we got you. Okay. Um, my question is, when y'all talking about that new rule for NFL, what does that do? What does that do to the onside kick, onside kick game? That's a good question. Uh, thank you for the call, Philip. The answer is that teams would have to tell the officials when they were doing an onside kick. There would be no more surprise onside kicks ever in the NFL under new kickoff rules, which I don't love. But that is a uh, a side effect of the kickoff rule proposal change. Uh, Bert seemed distraught by that, too. We went into break talking about this a little bit. Bert likes the element of surprise of, of, of running your kicker out there and trying to figure it out. Well, there's just so many avenues of fake onside kicks now. Like, you, you, you can act like you're going to the left, but then you kick to the right. They kick with their other leg behind their leg. There's just so many avenues. And if, if you get rid of the surprise onside kick, then... What, what do special teamers have to do? They're already sitting around doing nothing all practice anyway. They don't have anything to work on. That is true. That I, is 100% that's true. That's the best point that hasn't been made. Yet. I promise you, uh, in the middle of their practices, from someone who shared a uh, athletic facility as an athlete for a year and a half at the University of Tennessee with football, those special teamers, being a backup kicker is the best job in sports. The best. Because they're literally just playing catch in the indoor while the outdoor practice field is being used for actual football practice. And they Growing get mustaches. into all the parties and they stuff. Do. They, they get, get all the, the gear. Yeah. They get the backpack every year. They get the shoes. They don't have to travel every weekend. I wonder if you could try to get a, even an endorsement out of being That's a backup. a backup kicker? Yeah. No, no. You get what you what you weigh in this world, okay? <laughs> I know uh, Thomas Edwards, though, and like those offensive linemen when Dobbs was the quarterback got an ESPN interview because they had a Twitter thing called Life in the Shadows. Mm where they would take a selfie as the offensive line every time someone asked to take a picture with Dobbs out in public. So they actually got some shine out of that. Get so maybe here. you are right, actually. Okay. Mm-hmm. Wow. I, they just bet not miss is all I'm telling you. It's yeah. all, uh, that's the biggest mm-hmm. thing that the teammates are going to say. Don't miss, baby. So a 2025 SEC schedule for SEC teams is going to look nearly identical to their 2024 schedules. Uh, this game's, comes out yesterday from the SEC. The league will play an eight-game schedule this fall and will do the same in 2025 as the SEC expands to 16 teams. For Tennessee, it means the same opponents, but the location of the games are swapped. So this season, Tennessee plays on the road at Oklahoma, Arkansas, Georgia, and Vanderbilt. Those sites will be flipped in 2025, so they will host Oklahoma, Arkansas, Georgia, and Vandy. And then they will go, in 2025, they will go to Florida, Bama, Kentucky, and Mississippi State, the four teams who they host in 2024. Ramon, I like this element of it because it does remind me of the way things used to be in the SEC, where, for example, you guys went to LSU, came back from down three possessions. Jill Riggs Jr. scores an overtime touchdown, <laughs> and you beat LSU in Baton Rouge. And then the next year, you guys played a classic game with Jamarcus Russell at quarterback in Knoxville in, what, 2006 at that point? Sure did. Saw yep. him get on one knee and throw a ball like 70 yards in the pregame. Crazy. Game. Crazy, Caleb. Too I'm bad talk- he wasn't a good NFL player. Oh, my god, That game was insane. And Jonathan Crompton had to come in and nearly – nearly beat that Jamarcus Russell-led LSU team. but I Crazy. Don't. But, yes, I like that method a whole lot better. I remember going to Arkansas and then them coming to us. And, but what the, the reason I like it best is is the Ole Miss game, if I'm not mistaken, the one where some people were throwing mustard bottles on the field and stuff. <laughs> it would have been good to go to Oxford. Could have had a get back. You know, we could have got a get back. And I think you missed out on that because of this new format and stuff like that. I would have loved to see that team go back at Ole Miss. Uh, so, yeah, I do like that side of of, hey, game home and away when it comes down to setting the schedule up. But then it also gives balance, too. It also gives a year of trash talking. Mm-hmm. It gives a little bit of just everything of involving when you can do the one and one uh, with setting the schedule up. I'm glad they're going back to this way. Well, it looks like you guys will have a chance to get the victory in the swamp again. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, don't you put that evil on me. Try to get that. Try to get that. You got to keep on trying, baby. Everybody. I'm yeah, good. We'll get there. We'll get there. I'd be fine we'll with Tennessee time. never going to the swamp again. Uh, I will never go to the swamp again. got to get it done at some again. point, man. Mm-hmm. Until the day where if I'm blessed enough to call a game in the swamp, I am not going back to the swamp. <laughs> but you and Ron had such an adventure down there. That was in Baton Rouge. That was not the swamp. Oh, that wasn't the swamp. That's right. Did no. you go to the swamp this year? I did, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. So that wasn't Ron with you. That was not as fun of an adventure. No, I'm sure it wasn't. I, I, go to I that was, was sold the, y'all were going to get that one, too. That was the worst experience I have ever had as a road fan in my life, and it's not even close. Mm. Oh, mm-hmm. I don't know why you choose to go to Gainesville anyway. That's being so in, gross. Being in that little four-row section of Tennessee fans between the Florida students and the bench, mm. because there is an SEC rule that the opposing student section cannot be directly behind the visitor's bench, in Florida circumvents that rule more creatively than anyone else in the SEC by putting a five-row section of opposing fans between the students of the bench, which technically follows the rule. But if you were in that section and you were on the losing side, with how antiquated and archaic that stadium is getting in and out where it takes so long to move anywhere, oh, Terrible. G. So, Sully in the FN Bank chat says, My first time in the swamp as a student, I got I got spit on by a grown man. We're fighting. I had a buddy that happened to him uh seconds before the Jawan Jennings Hail Mary. Um if if you were out of Buffalo Wild Wings in Hendersonville, my buddy Rob came out Shout and out hung out. He specific he was the guy that a Georgia fan ran up to him after the Jacob Eason touchdown throw and spit on him. Oh my god. And then when Jawan Jennings caught the Hail Mary, that fan tucked his tail and ran out before my buddy could get his get back on that day. God. No. Have no. they renovated that thing in a while? My first game Florida? there was the first year I was here. I was like 2017. Florida or Georgia? No, Florida. The swamp. That it's place just so is, uh, old and nasty. It is very old. The concourses are pretty narrow and the the stairs to go up out yeah. of the section are like very, very narrow. Mm-hmm. And the bleachers are stacked on top of each other. It's a very intense environment. It's easy to see why they have such a big home field advantage, but uh-uh, I I will never go back there as a fan ever again. Ever again. Yeah, no, absolutely not. Um, that That's spitting on people's stuff, boy. They picked the right ones. Yeah. They picked the right ones, I'll tell you. Like, I'm talking about curb stomping at that point right Ooh. there. It's like, just have my bell ready. You you spit <laughs> or put your feet on somebody. No, you deserve you deserve a hip drop tackle. Demario in the effort and big chat on YouTube says, I would not have seen the no. Jennings touchdown if somebody spit on me. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be in a fight. No, you wouldn't. You shouldn't see it. And Demario, I got your bell if that is the case, okay? <laughs> like, no, absolutely. Oh, my God. Coming up. Adam Keisha, Kaplan. we're going to jail on that one, okay? Keisha, I know you're in the car right now. We're going to jail. Somebody spit on us in the state. <laughs> coming the bail up, money ready. R- Ramon's bail. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah coming How up much will money, be? I'm, I'm telling you, if that ever happens in the state, Moan got whisked out of the state, and you never have to guess what it was for. Well, when we come back, if you're needing Titans news, we will bail you out <laughs> with NFL insider and reporter Adam Kaplan. He'll give us interesting notes on two Titans free agency acquisitions specifically. And something he wrote yesterday that I find intriguing next. It's Ramon Foss for Artisan Custom Closets. Man, don't don't just clean up the mess in, in the messy areas of your home, okay? Get them organized with custom store solutions available at Artisan Custom Closets. Artisan has every option for every budget of your home and can pain point any area of your home that needs fixing, from garages to mud rooms to pantries, home offices, closets, and laundry rooms. Artisan can do it all. So let the local team at Artisan help you get rid of the clutter. Maximize your space. I promise you, you never know how big the space in your house is until you get it organized or just make your day-to-day easier with knowing what stuff is. Meet with their certified senior design consultants to fully customize the solution that fits your space needs from, from a free consultation at your home to the custom 3D plans that lay out your options and costs and an installation process to take less in a day. Artisan makes it easy to, to create calm. Simply reach out to them at 615-800-2199 or visit artisancustomcloses.com.
RKW is brewed by 8th and Roast on 104.5 The Zone. Ramon, Kayla, and Will with our 11-year NFL veteran, Ramon Foster. Kayla Anderson, I'm Will Bowling. Lots of Titans news and NFL free agency still to discuss. And joining us this morning, NFL insider and columnist for Pro Football Network. You hear him on Fox Sports Radio, Sirius XM. Follow his work on Twitter at Kaplan NFL. He is Adam Kaplan joining us here this morning on the show. What's up, Adam? How are you? Guys, good to talk to you. Yeah, I'm uh, getting ready to leave for the owners' meetings on Sunday. Uh, I think this will be like my 20th. Looking forward to that. Probably go to a couple pro days and just roll along here as we're about five weeks from the NFL draft. Well, Adam, uh, credit to you first and foremost because uh, I remember looking at the article you had right before the start of the legal tampering period, and you had the Titans going after Tony Pollard, pursuing Calvin Ridley, uh, all of the things that you talked about happened before free agency started. Uh, what stands out the most about the moves Rand Carthon and the Titans have made thus far? Yeah, and I, it's funny. I, I'm like, all right, I have a lot of Titans information this year for whatever reason. So I'm like, how am I going to categorize based on what I've heard? Well, they're going to be fairly aggressive. I should have said very aggressive. So Rand, look, Rand, this is his second year, and credit to the owner. Amy Adams Strunk, for spending money. You know, they, she gets criticized for being cheap, whether it's fair or not. Uh, I mean, I'm certainly going to defend her here. Their cash bet, I'm told, was just on contracts this year. Okay, it's always about cash, less about cap. It's about cash spend, and they're in about in the neighborhood of 80 million just for agents for just cash this year. It's a lot. That's a lot for that kind of market. So uh, they stepped it up. Look, uh, talking to other teams that faced the Titans last year. Let, let's call it like it is. Bad roster, very little speed on both sides of the football, particularly in offense. Offensive line dreadful, bottom three. They had to be aggressive. They just had to. Uh, look, that's not, you don't want to build your roster through free agency. It's got to be for the draft first. And Rand will have you know, this draft coming up to do, to do a lot more. But they had to do something and be aggressive, and, and credit to them. And uh, the, the only thing I'll say is you cannot win a Super Bowl by winning in free agency in March. It doesn't work that way. But you can build your roster with younger free agents. And getting Ridley, getting Cushenberry, who's terrific, getting Pollard, uh, getting, getting, getting Kenneth Murray, who needed a change of scenery. These things have a very good chance of working out. NFL insider Adam Kaplan, our guest, at Kaplan NFL on Twitter. Adam, you wrote on ProFootballNetwork.com specifically about Tony Pollard and feedback around the league regarding his signing with the Titans and, and made the note that there might also be a third running back to enter the mix. What, what kind of... A kind of closer option, as you write, might be in play for the Titans there. Yeah, so, so I, I had written a piece this week. I was not planning on doing it. What happened was, when you do what I do for a living, you, you know, have conversations with people, and every conversation that I had over like a 40-hour period when I was calling for draft information, trying to find out about certain players, it, it just became a free agency talk. I'm like, okay, I, I probably need to do something with this information. I, and I go, hey, by the way, what, 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 what moves did you like? And a lot of them came up with Cushenberry and particularly Pollard. And I know Pollard didn't have a great season. He was coming off of a pretty significant injury. But he's explosive. He brings it. The, the, the Titans see this as a two-man backfield. But the one thing they don't have now, if they could get a lead, I don't know if they'll be up in the fourth quarter a lot, and they have a, lot, they have a long way to go here, but if, if they're up in the fourth quarter, is there really a closer on the roster? I mean, Haskins is more of a you know, power back. I mean, it could be him, as I wrote. It could be somebody else who's not on the roster right now. But these things matter to coaches, and these matter to front office people, because you always have to ask yourself this question when you're running a football team. If this happens, what is our answer? This is what I've learned from talking to coaches and executives. That's the one thing at running back I don't know if they have right now is someone, if they get a lead, to close a game. Adam Kaplan with us this morning, uh, NFL insider and columnist of Pro Football Network. I, uh, this this question comes up right here because you said the spending as far as the Titans have done so far. And your assessment of watching teams operate like this, who've been bad the year before, rebuilding, reshaping, whatever you want to call it, what is the fine balance between spending money in free agency and trying to make sure you hit on your draft picks? Well, that's the point. Like, you know, as an NFL player, look, you you got to be careful. You, you, again, you can't win in March, it's, but you, you, you target certain players. Like, they targeted Calvin Ridley. As I wrote prior to free agency, they were looking for juice. They were looking for explosion. Calvin Ridley was that guy. Now, uh, I would tell you from talking to people close to the Jaguars, they didn't think that was going to happen. They thought they were getting him. 
but the Jaguars did. I mean, the Jag- the Titans got them, and, and what's got to be tough is it's the same division. But the way that it was explained to me by Bill Polian, Hall of Fame general manager, uh, when I worked with him at ESPN was, you build through the draft always, always, always. And Bill was not a big free agency guy. He didn't, he didn't really get involved in it. But you can't supplement. Talking to the Eagles over the years, you know, I, I live in the Philadelphia market, but I cover the entire league. Their belief is that you can do a little bit of both. Yes, you have. it's more about the draft, but – if you sign the right players, it could work. Now, the one thing that we have to make clear here, when you're signing somebody else's players, that's what free agency is, you don't, sometimes you don't know what you're getting. What you do do is you do two things. You go to your pro personnel staff. You talk to them. They have information. You go back if you had pre-draft interviews. Uh, what Andy Reid told me this one time. They would bring in players that they may not even, when Andy was with Philly, that they may not even be drafting, but they knew in free agency four or five years down the road, they want to go back to the, those interviews. Those interviews are taped. They want to know. They want to remember what those interactions were like. So to sum this up, it's always got to be about the draft first. Supplement for free agency. It's not like you're going to sign 20 free agents. I mean, they they signed about seven so far, and we'll see how they fit. There's that's that's a great point right there. Um, it brings a whole lot of stuff into context. And it also makes me ask the question, too, when it comes down to, you said, building through the draft, I think that's where your culture of your team, your standard, your type of guys come into play. What do you make of the Legereus Sneed situation as far as do you continue to, hey, give up a draft pick for a guy like him? Or do you say to yourself, hey, no, sit back. We just saw Kool-Aid McKinstry run a 447 with a drone, Jones fracture in his ankle, I mean, his foot. Do you go that route, or do you say be more competitive and go get a Legereus Sneed? Well, I, I think when, when when you look at this situation, Sneed, the, the Chiefs will listen. I mean, the Chiefs, the Chiefs, Chiefs are an interesting situation. They don't have anyone who could replace him, but to this point, they've been un, they've been unwilling to extend his contract to the point where he would be happy, and he is on the franchise tag. That 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 would take significant draft compensation. You're looking for more than a, a first round pick. But if you're the, just just to extrapolate this, if you're the Titans right now, let, let, let's call it like it is. Yes, the Woozy was signed. Uh, they were looking for a guy to hold down the fort for two seasons. McCreary's more of a nickel, more of an inside player. Uh, you, you, Molden can do it as well. They they don't have an outside corner uh, opposite of Woozy. And always understand, folks. Once and Ramon, you know this as a player. Once you get to 30 years old, they're looking to replace you. That's just the way it is. They're, they're always looking. This is the way clubs think, and unfortunately. Because of Caleb Farley's injury history, you know he may not factor in at all at this point. So they have to do something significant at corner. Now, you know they could do it in the first round or second round. That's a major issue. Uh, edge rusher is another problem for this football team. They still have a lot of needs. Remember John Lynch, the general manager of the Niners, telling me you can't solve every problem in one off season. And Rand Carthen's trying to address as many as he can for the near future for the next couple years. But the draft is about the future, three, four, five, six years down the line. As I just mentioned, outside corner, Sneed, you, you can look at him, uh, that possibility. But more, more realistically, folks, it's going to come in the draft. That's just the way it is. Adam Kaplan, NFL insider. You can follow him on X at Kaplan NFL. On the note of the defense, and that's really where I think fans are kind of questioning, you know, why maybe didn't we see more uh, adds in that selection, especially in the secondary, because it has been kind of a non-factor since the Logan Ryan years and, and you know, when they had those guys here. So with that, in terms of a safety, too, because you've got Imani Hooker, yep. but there's not really another guy on the uh, on the other side of him either. So what, what would you say for safety, too? Is there somebody out there they could still add for a decent price? All right, so the, what is, the way it's explained to me by personnel people around the NFL is it's still a buyer's market in the National Football League at safety. Now, there's a reason why a lot of these guys are out there. Justin Simmons is still really good. Uh, from what I understand, there are at least three or four teams that are interested in him. Uh, he does turn 31. He's an older player. Micah Hyde is out there, older player. Condre Diggs was just released. Uh, J. Ron Curse is more of, a, he's more of a nickel safety who's a matchup safety uh, for tight ends. To Sean Gibson, I know the Niners want him back. It, it, if you look at these contra, if you look at these players, they're all older. The only guy that that I'm a little surprised is not signed with anyone is, is Julian Blackman of the Colts. Now he's had an injury history. He's the one young guy. Now Marcus May, I know the Titans, as I, I said on Twitter yesterday, Denard Wilson, 
the defense coordinator really likes him. Uh, and by the way, I could also tell you they were they were they were deep into conversations about Cam Curl leading up to free agency. I thought actually there was a point where he might have signed there. He didn't he sign with the Rams, but Marcus May is a guy that they like. So how much do you feel like these new additions on this staff? You just mentioned Denard Wilson. He's worked with so many guys. Uh, you got Bill Callahan on the line. Uh, how much do you feel like that is helpful in bringing some of these these guys here where, look, they, they haven't been good for a couple of years. It's not an easy place to attract some of these guys. Yeah, I would say this. Uh, Brian Callahan's a dynamic young head coach. He's brought his dad in, obviously. Bill Callahan is his not that there's a Hall of Fame for offensive line coaches, but he would be right there if there happened to be one. And, you know, Lloyd Cushenberry did say that was part of the reason why he signed there. So uh, you, you have to look at that. That does matter. Um, Denard is a dynamic coach. I remember him as a player many years ago. Uh, Chris Harris, I remember covering him, who's, who's going to uh, see their defensive backs. Ben Bloom's a really good coach who's coached defensive line and linebackers for the Cowboys and, and Browns. Steve Jackson's been around for a long time. Tracy Rocker. Uh, got in the Super Bowl with the Eagles. You, you know, you, uh, Ed Dontel's son, Steve, who's, who's an up-and-coming coach. Ty Tolbert has coached a lot of great receivers in the National Football League. Randy Jordan, I remember, was a player. Nick Holtz was with the Raiders and other teams who did a great job as an offense coordinator at UNLV for a season. So, so to answer your question, it's a pretty good sort of interesting staff here. Bo Hardigree's worked with a lot of quarterbacks, worked with the Patriots. But, again, it's the roster. The roster needs a lot of upgrading, and they'll grow. These coaches will grow with this roster as Rand Carthon adds players. NFL insider Adam Kaplan, our guest, at Kaplan NFL on Twitter. Adam, we talk about a lot of Titans defensive targets, specifically in free agency. You mentioned Cam Curl. I know you've written about C.J. Garner-Johnson, D.J. Reader, another guy who has been linked to the Titans, Jerome Baker, who took a visit here and even Chase Young. I know those are case-by-case situations, and you've got some injuries, you've got some different variables in each individual signing, but what do you feel like has prevented the Titans from making that big move defensively that we're still waiting on? Well, no, they, they, again, they did look at things, but they spent so much cash on Ridley. I, they, remember, they spent a lot on, on Ridley, a lot on Cushenberry. They spent decent cash on a Woozy, decent cash on Murray. There's almost there's only so much money you're going to spend. Remember, it's about cash and and, and, and your cash spend and what's allocated by the owner, ownership and, and, the, and the president. And look, they've spent a lot of money now. Yeah, when you look at edge rusher, unless you were getting on these guys the first day, you weren't getting anyone. It was not a good free agent class at edge rusher. There were a ton of defensive tackles, but when you really look at it, they weren't in on Daniel Hunter. They weren't getting Brian Birds. That thing was done very quickly to the Giants. Grenard, I didn't hear them uh, in that. Bryce Huff, that was not happening. I was told he was going to the Eagles from day one. Now, Chase Young, it could have been a, like they could have done what the, the Saints did. But Chase Young, obviously, is coming back from um, an injury here, which is going to keep him down for a bit. Then there were secondary players. As I wrote for free agency uh, before it started, D.J. Wanham is a guy that was a, one of my top sleepers. Not a lot of fans know about him. Sign a uh, decent free agent deal with, with the Panthers. He'll get a chance to take his career to the next level. But again, guys, as I go through these names here, that's it. For, for, for You have to be careful, but it, because they were not in on Burns and Hunter and Grenard, it, it, you might as well move toward the draft. When it comes down to just the NFL free agency in general, have you ever seen more motion, more movement as far as uh, franchise quarterbacks being traded, moved to other teams? Is this going to be the new norm because of the misses on first-round quarterbacks or just quarterbacks coming out of college? Well, listen, I, I, I'll even take this a step further. I've never seen so much talk and movement with number two quarterbacks. Flacco, I, I, I put out his contract information on ProFootballNetwork.com this week. Garoppolo immediately signs with the Rams. Russell Wilson, now he's going to start for the Steelers. Uh, Drew Locke moved. Sam Darnold moved. Tyrod Taylor moved. Tyler Huntley moved. Mason Rudolph, who came out of nowhere to do really well. Josh Jobs moved again. You guys know him. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Eagles were in on Easton Stick, but he went back to the Chargers. Mariota moved to Washington. Look look at all this movement. This This is, and then of course Cousins, if you look at the big movers, Kirk Cousins with that $45 million a year deal, a two-year structure on a four-year deal, to be the, the Falcons franchise quarterback for at least two seasons of a four-year deal. You're right. I mean, a lot of movement. Jacoby Brissett moved again. It's, this is, I've not seen it. J- James Winston, yeah. And, and by the way, 
Ryan Tannehill's still out there. Yeah. That's been a little bit of a surprise. I was going to ask you that, too, to follow up on that. Do you feel like, I mean, he's going to land somewhere, obviously. Yep. Where would you feel like would be the best fit at this point since really a lot of the pieces have moved? I typically at this point, when I talk to clubs, it's usually the, who, who has experience with this player. I had written weeks ago that here are the five quarterbacks the Steelers are looking at. Tannehill was lower on the Steelers list, and obviously they didn't wind up going in that direction. You're right, yeah, he'll have a job by training camp, and he's in his mid-30s, he's not starving, nothing needs to happen. It's going to be hard. I mean, it's simply where there's not a number two quarterback. Uh, You know, as I go through my list here, there are not a lot of openings here. Um, Yeah, honestly, guys, there's just that with Tyrod Taylor going to the Jets. I know the Jets are looking at a bunch of quarterbacks that, that Taylor's filled that role. There's just not a lot of options there, uh, and Dobbs just signed with the Niners this week. It's hard, unless now again we, we, we're we're in the third week of March here. Quarterbacks could be cut, players could be cut after the draft. That could open up some openings here uh, for him. But I'm not seeing a natural fit right now. Adam Kaplan with us this morning. You can follow him on Twitter at Kaplan NFL. Uh, I, I'm gonna throw some numbers at y'all. You're probably gonna be shocked real quick, but right. one one hundred million, um, fifty three million, and fifty million. Those are numbers given out to interior offensive linemen in this uh, free agency cycle right now. Is that gonna be the new norm, or this is just a market saying, "Hey, we'll give the interior guys a little bit of a bone." And me myself, being a former guard, I love seeing this type of stuff because the tackles have always gotten all the love, and we said we are football players too. I know, but see, Ramon, you know from with the Steelers, they do contracts a certain way. It, it's I study contracts, like, and the Steelers, you know, they 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 don't give a lot of guarantees. It's usually a massive signing bonus, big base salary year one, and that's it for guarantees. Now, as we move along here, the Eagles made Landon Dickerson the highest paid guard in NFL history at twenty one million, and the, the structure is very good. But yeah, you, you Cushenberry got a nice deal. A bunch of guards are getting paid. Yeah, is that the new norm? Yes, because once one guy does it, clubs can't say, "Well, we're not doing that." It's particularly if they drafted the player and the guy's a great football player, they got to pay him. On the center market now, with Kelsey, Jason Kelsey retiring, he was the highest paid center for for a bunch of years. Those those dollars could be fifteen million a year. Uh, the guard market is now twenty one million a year. Yeah, it is going up though. To answer, it's a good question. Uh, the tackle market is going up, uh, but. Every team has a philosophy of what they're going to pay and not going to pay. Well, the Rams, by the way, they just paid two guards $17 million a year. I was stunned. Uh, Kevin Dotson, who I'm told the Steelers didn't want, he went, came out of nowhere. I, I was, he played great football. Good for him, and his agent did a great job, $17 million a year. Jonah Jackson of the Lions didn't make a hard play to resign, $17 million a year. You're right. That's the money is going up at the guard position, no question. And your expert opinion, just real quick, well, if if you're picking that seven with what the Titans need, you going D B or you going playmaker or Joe Alt. Oh boy. Okay, so if you and I are running the show and if I'm if I'm the general manager and you're my lieutenant, um I'll I, if I'm making a call, if I'm turning the card in I take the edge rusher over the lineman, but I I know this. You may disagree with me. If it's your call, I'll go with what you want. It's hard to find edge rushers. It, it's really it, their line is so bad. It, it's got a, it, it. It probably it, it's a it's edge rusher left tackle. I mean, take your pick. I how about this one? The best available edge rusher or left tackle there. Whatever whoever has the highest grade. That's it. But see, with, with the run on quarterbacks, is going to be primed that either one of them can be there. Who's is beauty's in the eye of the beholder, I guess. <laughs> and then with Joe, listen, Joe Alt, Joe Alt's a stud. There's no question about it. And look, Skronsky's playing inside. They've got two. They've got two building blocks right now. Skronsky and Cushenberry. That's it. Rand Carthon knows he's he's been around the game with his father and and he's won a lot in his career. He knows. The best way to build your football team is with the lines, offensive, defensive lines. That's where it has to start. The Titans still are a long ways away from being a playoff team. If Rand could just do that, just build year to year, going with their offensive line and, and defensive line and edge rushers, then build from the back, then this thing's got a great chance of getting turned around. Adam Kaplan bringing us the goods this morning. Ooh. NFL insider and columnist for Pro Football Network. You hear him on Sirius XM, Fox Sports Radio, and everywhere on Twitter at 
Kaplan NFL. Adam, great stuff. Thanks so much. Definitely. Thanks, Adam. Right, thank you. See you. Right. Absolutely. There's Adam Kaplan with us this morning. Lots of info there we will react to coming up next. And an edge rusher conversation that we have not heard elsewhere that you just heard right here on RKW. We'll react coming up. Hey, it's Kayla Anderson with QC Kinetics. Uh, great time of year. Sun is shining this morning. Uh, maybe you want to get out and do some stuff, and you want to do that without feeling the pain in your joints. Uh, QC Kinetics is probably then the solution for you. QC Kinetics is the nation's leader in regenerative medicine. Talking about long-lasting joint pain relief here. No surgery, no drugs, no downtime. In fact, QC Kinetics is literally transforming lives. Their advanced treatments Harness your own body's ability to restore and repair that damaged joint tissue. So we know that pro athletes, they've been doing this for decades. But now this life-changing treatment is available just for you. So you can walk and run, climb stairs, play golf, play with your kids, whatever you want to do. Just move again pain-free. No pain pills, no risky surgery. This is an all-natural solution. QC Kinetics has tens of thousands of satisfied patients who have really reclaimed their mobility back. So it is time to get on the pain-free train. Call QC Kinetics now for a free consultation, 615-249-4024. That's 615-249-4024.
Thursday morning, on Ramon, Kayla, and Will is brewed by 8th and Roast, RKW. Ramon Foster, Kayla Anderson, Will Bowling. If you missed our conversation with NFL insider Adam Kaplan, that will be posted on our podcast feed in a matter of seconds, I would say before 8 o'clock. I would imagine it will have populated on your feed. Go to Ramon, Kayla, and Will on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, the two we recommend using the most. Or 1045thezone.com as well. Also helping the people make some money today. Kyle in Springfield in the FNM Bank chat asks, anyone got any wild parlays for today? Mm. Kyle, if you go to the end of 3HL's show yesterday, a seven-leg parslay was given to the people. It's got some juicy nuggets in there that uh, you can enjoy. Okay. So we'll give a little shout-out to our 3HL friends and go to the end of their show yesterday. Okay. Like the last like three minutes, and he's got a parslay for you. There it is, right there, Calvin. So where you feel? Oh, when we're on break, go over to their stream and look at the end of that. That's right. Exactly. You got to be fair trade. I will be riding Ron Slay's parlay today. Absolutely. I have to slay Ron, baby. Might put a dollar on it. Wasn't it like seven? Seven legs. Yeah. He had, a, I think, a 13-leg one, too, or 12-leg that did not make air. Ah. But like a centipede. Slay's working. Eight. Absolutely. He's always working. Well, he um, actually got a couple days off now. Good he stuff does. with... Adam Kaplan a few minutes ago, who tells us the Titans were so far deep into discussions with safety Cam Curl that Adam thought the deal was done. Cam Curl ends up signing a two-year deal with the L.A. Rams. That was six days ago, so last Wednesday, a two-year deal for $8.75 million that goes up to $12.75 million. And Cam Curl was kind of a hybrid safety linebacker for the Washington Commanders last season, turns 25 on March 31st, the youngest safety really that was out there among the Simmons, Marcus May, the older options, Quandre Diggs, Jamal Adams, who are available, and perhaps gives us a little bit of insight into into the Titans prioritizing youth versus experience at the safety position specifically. Yeah, uh, would have been a good addition to have a guy, especially at the, the contract that he was given. L.A.'s hard to pass on, I'm sure, as part of it. Former seven-round pick is what I've seen also. Uh, but there is spots that need to be filled. I thought Adam Kaplan's point on there's only so much you can do was probably the fairest point that you can ask of a guy. Unless you're getting a, uh, you know, a, a late-signing veteran in that May, June, July era, of, of the offseason is probably what you're left with post the draft. So we'll see what happens. It will be a spot field. But I think we all have gotten excited with what's happened so far with the signings. There have been some big ones mm-hmm. that you almost feel like, well, well, where's the next one? And that may actually be it. And like I said, the people I've talked about talked to um, when it comes down to making another big signing have said a lot that's coming out of like Kansas City – it's not all true. Yeah. So that's where you got to somewhat just say, all right, we've done enough. You can't build Rome in one off season. So I, I think that's the biggest thing that Adam kind of pushed that point of you really have to build your team from the the base, which is the draft. And unfortunately, because the Titans missed on so many of these draft classes, it, it put them back. And that's just facts, right? I mean, you can't always just fix that in one off season. And I think they've done a good job, at least offensively filling a lot of these holes in free agency with players that I think will be impactful. But unfortunately there are still holes specifically on the defensive side that we mentioned. And we asked about, you know, the secondary, the safeties. And he said, you know, a lot of these guys are 30 plus and it's not necessarily something where you're going to want to pay a lot of money to have those guys come over and maybe help you out for a year. So he just emphasized, you know, getting that quarter possibly in the draft. And I think that's what you're going to have to do is have a little more patience. I think they'll add some players. They're just not going to be those big named guys that you're going to say, oh, those are going to be difference makers. In the F and Bank chat on YouTube, John Michael asks right now, who are the starting safeties? That would be Amani Hooker and Elijah Molden, I would imagine. Yep. Yeah. Those are two with the most experienced ones that are probably going to be relied on to do the most work as far as teaching, guiding, and being field general. So, yeah, definitely. I do not think those will be your two starting safeties week one, but we'll see. 
615-737-1045, our number. Tennessee begins its NCAA tournament journey tonight. What do you need to see from them against St. Peter's to make you feel better about their chances in March? Next. Hey, it's Kayla Anderson and Ramon Foster with Window Nation. Ooh, it's looking good out there today. Maybe that will give you some time to do some spring cleaning. And while you're at it, hey, pop open your window. Uh, make sure that it is opening properly. Make sure there's no cracks, uh, no leaking going on. And if your window just won't stay open while you're trying to get in some breeze, that probably means you need new windows from Window Nation. They've got a great deal going on right now. Buy two windows, get to free plus get this get zero get zero down zero interest zero payments for a whole 24 months no doubt about it man the other part kayla is they're not putting you in a box they have over 1500 custom vinyl window combinations available to you windows is all they do so much so that they have over 20,000 online positive re- positive reviews they do a really good job so good of a job that 96 percent of their windows they install require no follow-up service at all if you need new windows in your house for any particular reason call a 90 nation or go online to windownation.com
What's going on, you bunch of bracket busters? What's uh, happy? Good morning, eight oh one from the one oh four five The Zone Studios. I am Robert Walsh. Last of the play-in games as the madness fully envelops our bodies, grambling over Montana State, eighty-eight, eighty-one, Colorado over those blue-fielded Boise Staters, sixty to fifty-three. The tournament starts today in the West Region with Michigan State and Mississippi State at eleven fifteen. You can contract all the madness right here on 104.5 The Zone. Later in the day, the Vols taking on the St. Peter's Peacocks tonight at 820. And those excited about a potential homecoming for Derek Barnett, he has signed a one-year deal to return to the Houston Texans in six games with the Texans, compiling two and a half sacks, eight tackles for a lost, and 11 quarterback hits. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and the Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Second half of the show already as we welcome you into our number three of Ramon, Kayla, and Will. RKW, as always, we are caffeinated and opinionated thanks to our friends at 8th and Rose with locations on 8th Avenue, Charlotte, the airport, the Broadview at Vanderbilt, right over here, a hop, skip, and a jump away in Midtown. 8th and Rose Coffee cultivates community by the cup, and you can find your favorite retail bag in every local Kroger and Whole Foods as well. I get my 8th and Rose coffee for my place of residence at the Publix and Capitol View. 615-737-1045, how you jump in with Ramon Foster and Kayla Anderson, Robert Walsh, who makes the show happen. I'm Will Bowling, and coming up in 15 minutes, Titans Radio's head coach, Coach Mack, will join us. Mack attack. I feel like it's been a minute, but he was on the the station last week with us sure was i don't know why i feel like during football season it feels longer between the days that we get to talk to our favorite coach man mac attack brings it man i'm looking forward to talking to him seeing what he got going on you know it's 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 mac on tour what i feel like right now you know well no is that summertime it's mostly summertime right i wonder what he does like during his downtime everything during most interesting man in the world national interviews Mm -hmm. watching draft stuff Draft stuff. Coleman is his nice hair. I'm talking about immaculate hair. That's what it yeah. is. Feel me? Isn't yes. it ridiculous that Major League Baseball is happening right now? Yes. Is it ridiculous? It makes me mad. Second game yeah. of the season. It's yeah. happening in Korea. And a sport that desperately wants more eyeballs on it and relevance and to be talked about decides, let's put the first two games of our season at 5 a.m. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It doesn't benefit baseball fans or just like Will said, those who like like your kids getting up at, hey, kiddos, we're getting up at 2 a.m. just to watch the start of the MLB season in Korea. What's that, mom and dad? To, to be fair, I did text them yesterday morning. I was like, hey, the Dodgers and Padres are playing right now. So I, text your I boys. did. Yeah, I texted our family group chat. I was like, hey, the games is on right now. So I, that was a benefit. What on time was end. that? That was uh, about 630 yesterday morning. It is 12 to 9 right now. The Padres leading the Giants, uh, excuse me, the Dodgers, and the Dodgers have the tying run at the plate. Mookie Betts with the home run. Did it? He got one in? Nashville zone. VFL, Mookie Betts. Love Mookie Betts. That close. That close. What still, a great guy for the game. It's still so funny when he did that interview with Carl Ravitch, I think Jimmy Dykes, in the Grant Williams 40 point game. Tennessee Vandy, and they're like, so you're a Nashville guy? And he was like, I'm a Tennessee guy. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Mookie, Yes, man. sir, you Over are. Over Grad. Uh, That's right, go Bobcats. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely, man. But it is kind of annoying, because I just, I, I feel like it got buried a little bit, because a lot of people didn't even know it was going on, and then all of a sudden you're hearing updates on scores, and you're saying, wait, MLB is, I thought spring training's still going on. Well, that's baseball in general, though, right? Uh, that, that that's the way it's always been described to me and the way yeah. people treat it is, hey, we'll get the baseball when we're done with draft and we got summer stuff going on. Opening day, I mean, is a thing. It used to be bigger for opening day, in my opinion. Well, opening day is still a big deal. Like, I feel like that's still one of the last sacred things in the sport that people still get excited about. 
Yeah. And they're diminishing it by having like a kind of fake opening day in Korea the week before the season starts. I feel that. And I'd also say, well, if it's not going to grow here and then they got to grow it globally somewhere else. Well, it's huge there. I'm a defender of it because my kids play it. So that's it's my first love. So I'll always defend it. But they got it. They got to be pumping it up here in America. You want to do play by play? I will. Rosario grounds out to the pitcher. (laughs) Out at first. San Diego was time and score nine. There you Top go. Top of the eighth. One out. Up next at bat. I have no idea because I don't have the lineup. <laughs> I could do it. Yeah, that was good. I just need it. I just need it. There's a lot of time in baseball to fill. That's the one thing about that being a play-by-play or a color. You, there's a lot of time to fill. Can confirm. Yeah, 100%. You know? yeah, no, I know you've done my it. specialty. My it mind. is uh, my probably <laughs> second favorite sport to call. Yeah. Baseball is? It's probably because you can just favorite. talk. You can tell good stories. It's like hosting a radio show. Is it? Okay, that makes sense. That's why I, that's why soccer is my overall favorite because soccer and baseball have a similar cadence to them as a play by play guy. Yeah, I salute y'all on that. That's why I'm not as big of a fan of like the faster pace stuff where you can't be as creative. You just have mm-hmm. to literally say what's happening in front of you over and over and over. Everyone has their preferences, but yeah, they do. You can really dissect the game of baseball. That's why I love it. It gives you time to do that. Yeah. Tennessee St. Peter's tonight in the NCAA tournament first round, 820 on TNT from the Spectrum Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. What do you need to see for the Vols tonight in order to feel better about them after Friday's loss? Pace. I got to see pace and rhythm. And that is probably the most obvious thing, but they were so disjointed. I felt like the last couple, well, the Kentucky game, not as much. They got it together at the last, uh, during the last game and in, 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 uh, Thompson Bowling. I need to see pace. I need to see shots going. I need to see a sense of urgency in this one. Because, again, I, I heard Todd Furman yesterday on Ron, them show. Ron, who the heck is Ron? On Savage, them show on 3HL. It's just, just breaking down like, hey, teams that, that, that have a first-round exit in a tournament championship, I mean a tournament uh, series, they don't do well in March Madness. And that's what I need from them. I need to see shots go in. I know that's a product of the player, not necessarily the team. But their aggressiveness and ability to fight, like I need to see a big-time win from them and not a ooze to a finish despite – Whatever St. Peter's throw at them, they got to dominate because yeah. they've been more, they've been less than dominant the last two games. And whether they contribute that to we're just getting by so we can practice or what, I don't like it. I just need to see it this tonight. This team needs to come in knowing who they are. They're Tennessee, they're the heavy favorite. They've got to leave those last two games behind them. And they've got to come in, and I think they've got to set the pace from the start. From the start, from the jump. I don't care if it's a boring game because it's it's going to be somewhat of a blowout. I don't really care. That's that's what Tennessee needs to do to this Peacock team who likes to slow it down, obviously, you know, is more known for their defense. I think Tennessee needs to show who they are. We've got one of the best players in the the country in Dalton Connect. We've got one of the best guards. Um... You know what guard play is in the tournament, right? I think Zakai needs to set the tone and 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 start that from the the jump with his play. You got to hit the shots, guys. You got to hit them against a, a team like this where you should bury them. There's only one player remaining from St. Peter's Elite Eight team a couple of years ago, the team that ultimately lost to eight seeded North Carolina at that point, one step away from the Final Four. That's guard Latrell Reed who averaged just over eight minutes a game in 2022. He is now the second leading scorer of this team, averaging 11 points, four and a half rebounds, and four and a half assists. He's going to play almost the entire game. And Tennessee assistant Rod Clark, talking to the media on Tuesday, said the gritty up-in-your-face style that they played in 2022 is the same. The players are different. The coach, Shaheen Holloway, is now at Seton Hall, his alma mater. So... Uh, different coaching staff and different management for this team. But I think for Tennessee, I need to see better defense on the ball. And that's not something that we talk about a lot with a Rick Barnes coached Tennessee team, but the way Mississippi state scored their points last Friday is a bit concerning. And, And they outscored Tennessee 42 to 14 in the paint, but it wasn't just throwing it down to a big man and letting Tolu Smith get all of his points. Tolu Smith only had seven points and five boards. 
against Tennessee. Tennessee's guards were getting beat off the dribble in a way that we don't often see them get beat by an athletic and long Mississippi State team that was able to finish really well at the rim over Tennessee's defenders. I need to see Tennessee correct that immediately because Tennessee's not going to go far if you have that many blow-bys for Santiago Vescovi, for Josiah Jordan-James, for guys like Jemai Meshack. This is not a team athletically that's going to challenge you anywhere close to the way Mississippi State did. But I do think against this team, you need to correct your biggest errors last Friday. That and the, your point as far as blowing by the, the guards too, positioning in the post. I, mm-hmm. I saw time and time again either in the Kentucky game and the Mississippi State game where our bigs just got posted out and let the uh, they let point guards make the easy layup on them time and time again. So I'm not telling them go out there and fight and, 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 and you know, get fouls and stuff like that as far as Adu is concerned. But him getting boxed under the rim to create a path for the guards to score – Mississippi State had their way with that one in the, in the SEC tournament. And you mentioned, you know, some of the veterans on this team. Like, this is their last go-around. I would think they'd want to leave it all out there. And Vescovy is the prime example. Like, he just hasn't been on this year. He hasn't been on from from the three-point land. That, that percentage has gone down for him individually. I would feel like if this is your last shot... As a Vol, and you have a chance to really take this team far, contribute to that, they need to step it up. Oh. Coming up next, Titans Radio's head coach, Coach Dave McGinnis, joins us for his weekly segment. We'll talk hip drop tackles. We'll talk Calvin Ridley. We'll talk a little bit of quarterback play as well in the NFL draft, like you did with Rhett Bryan on yesterday's show, in a way that only Coach Mack can. Coming up next.
When you hear that music, it is time to talk to Titans Radio's head coach. Right here on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. Ramon Foster, Kayla Anderson, Will Bowling. Coach Mack is brought to you by Two Rivers Ford, Middle Tennessee's most trusted local Ford dealership for 40 years. Coach Mack, what's going on? Will, Kayla, Ramon, how we doing, guys? We're good, uh, Coach. I just got off, I just got off and, uh, talking with Bert quite a bit. He calls early so we can talk. Bert's moving into the scouting world, which, I, you know what, I'm kind of impressed. I'm way more impressed with Bert's scouting ability than I am with him playing in the flag. <laughs> <laughs> I'm honestly Fair. with you on that. And the amount of times where I am not as well-versed on a prospect and Bert will say something in my ear that I can look smart, usually if I say something intelligent on this radio program, it's because Robert Walsh has said it first in my ear. No, and I'm serious about that. He he's he's clearly studied it, and uh, he had some excellent excellent talking points. So anyway, uh, Coach Mack, I know you guys were talking on Three HL on your weekly hit with them about uh, uh, Don Davenport's potential Tennessee versus Auburn March Madness championship, and how you're you're cheering for Tennessee and Auburn. Can you just be prepared to mediate a very contentious uh, relationship between us and Three HL if that does happen? Well, first of all, uh, I know that it, it you would love it because it's 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 SEC centric. And That's I, right. Of course, I understand. Look, both of those both of those places, uh, I've been to games at, to both of those places. Uh, you know, in, in my career, it, it's a rabid fan base on both of them. But I, I would think just the fact that the SEC could get that far in this tournament that nobody could be mad. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. That's fair, enough. fair, Coach Mack. I- I'm with you on that one. Uh, Coach Mack with us, presented by Two Rivers Ford. Coach Mack, let's talk about the newest Tennessee Titan and Sebastian Joseph Day, a guy who had a lot of success in L.A. playing next to Aaron Donald. How will he help Jeffrey Simmons on this Titans defensive line? Well, kind of the same way. I mean, it's a nice veteran piece. And, uh, you know, in this in the, in this uh reset that this roster is going through you're going to need some of those veteran pieces you're going to have to have it and then especially on the defensive front the defensive front still needs to be added to it was a nice it was a nice uh piece of a veteran player and and you're right i mean he look that i've done a lot of aaron donald stuff this week you know since he announced his retirement you know you know just you know, across a lot of platforms because I was there from the start with with Aaron Donald, and to me, uh, Jeffrey Simmons will will he Jeffrey Simmons will be able to to play off of and and have uh, Sebastian Day be able to play off of him because they're both veteran players that pretty much understand what their roles are, and uh, so it was a nice signing. I, I like the signing, especially at this point in free agency there are levels of free agency and then there's also points that 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 free agency you know early on you you when you've got money and you're trying to reset your roster you know you kind of you've got to go out and you've got to kind of step step pretty heavy but then as you start working down through free agency you've got to get a little, little bit more judicious with what you do i thought this was a good uh uh signing in that wave of free agency for what the titans need and they they still got holes to fill but he'll it'll be a nice addition because you got a veteran player that's able to to create some things on his own but having a really good three technique next to him will help coach mac how how much of the evaluation is still going on with the current roster of of players that the uh, coach callahan and the rest of his staff have to see or does that happen just mainly on the field well, I mean, they'll have to see him on the on the grass, but you know, as soon as you come in as a new staff, the thing that's important, of course, they've got the advantage of having Rand here, you know, before before they got here. But but they they put their eyes on on the tape really quick, and then you know, getting them on the grass with the guys that that are going to going to be with you once it starts up again, and and you can get you can start early because you've got a new coaching staff, you know, out there on the grass with them. The thing that the thing that's important. Uh, first of all, is to get a base when you're looking at them, because uh, and I think we've talked about this before. But even before, one of the things they were grinding on when they first got here, and the reason they were staying up there, you know, so late at that facility, and all staying in hotels so that they, you know, could just just come right down the street and, and go to work and, and stay late, is those is is putting together those those uh, uh, prospect tapes. 
as far as uh, that they wanted to look at and they wanted to show this, this scouting department the types of people they are looking for and how the people that are there presently fit into that and then be able to start with into the free agency as far as the traits that, they, that, they, that they're looking for. So they've already done a lot of that, but again, the guys that are that are going to be here when this starts, Ramon, it's important just to get them on the grass in the classroom so that you really start to know the people. And I think you've heard, I mean, you heard Rand say that when he first got here, that you can look at a tape and kind of find and see what a guy is fundamentally, but until you learn who they are as people, then you're really getting into the evaluation as to how they're going to fit what you're trying to do. Coach Mack, we had an opportunity talking to Adam Kaplan. He brought up something that happened in real life here this week. He spoke about on those 30 visits, you have an opportunity to sit down and record podcasts with guys or record them. And the Titans did sure. that with Calvin Ridley recently. And Mike Keefe and Amy Wells revisited that with Calvin Ridley. He got an opportunity to see himself as a young man years ago, and you saw him get emotional and break down. Do you think stuff like that should be done more often, Coach Mack, if you're interested in a guy revisiting that tape? And what does that do also for the coaches? We know what it does for us, right, as far as people that consume that type of stuff. But what does that also do with the coaches when they evaluate those sit-downs if they do that type of stuff? Well, everybody does, everybody does it. But I, I'm, I just let's just go back a minute to what Mike and Amy did when they sat down. Of course, you know, Mike Keith and, and uh, you know, and and Amy Wells, and I'm not saying just, you know, out of prejudice because because I, I work with them. They're the best. They're the absolute best. And they, you know, they it, it, it's, a, it's a skill to be able to sit down and, and, and visit with, you know, with high-tier athletes and really kind of, you know, dig a little, not dig a little deeper, but just let, let, let them, let them talk as human beings. Uh, that was, that was as an outstanding an interview and as, as, as I've seen. And it was, uh, you know, I, I think that, that was, you saw a true emotion, but I, as far as, as recording those types of things, you know, Ramon now, I mean, it's, it's, it, they, they, the, all these interviews, they're recorded at the senior bowl. They're recorded at, you know, they're recorded at the combine. They're recorded on 30 visits because, you know, you can glean, uh, you know, quite a bit, even though people will say, well, you know, sometimes, you know, at that point in their lives, they're programmed. Well, but they're still, you can look into it. And, and I thought, I thought what, what that uh, displayed was just really because, you know, you go through a lot of different things. All of us do is in development, you know, as people throughout our careers. I thought that was a very, very revealing and a very authentic interview. It, it was, it was, a little bit it was a little bit deeper than i mean it wasn't superficial at all it was real and uh as i said i thought mike keith and amy wells you know and calvin ridley did it did a tremendous job with that that's worth that's worth watching you need to go you need to go to the otp and 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 take a look at that yeah and i just thought overall the the presser he had was really impressive just the rawness of it but also showing how much desire he has to put his best work out on the field. Just, you know, after listening to that, Coach Mack, what what do you feel like we're going to get from this guy this season in a room with another veteran in D-Hop and hopefully a guy who can learn from these two in uh, Traylon Burks? Well, I mean, that's – and that's some of the beauty of free agency is, is, is that you're able to – I mean, it's a different evaluation, uh, and I know you know this, and you know, for our listeners, evaluating evaluating a collegiate player is a lot different than evaluating a free agent, as far as to what as to what. First of all, you know what the what the the payment's going to be for, them, but second of all, just what they're going to bring, because the one thing that you cannot manufacture in this business, regardless of skill set, is is experience. And so I, I think what, what we saw in that interview was just life experience and also experience that he's going to bring. I mean, I'm, I'm really looking forward to watching this thing start in its first iteration as far as unfolding on the field with all of these new additions. Now, it's, it, guys, it's going to take, it's going to take more than, more than uh, you know, one of these uh, talent acquisition periods to get this thing reset the way they want to reset it. But they're, they're, they started out really, really well. It's going to be interesting to watch, but I, the, especially offensively, you, we're watching a complete offensive philosophy reset here, and so it's going to be you, you're, you've got guys at least now that have you have an opportunity to to build a base pretty quickly with because of their experience. 
Yeah, and, and you're right. It, it does start with, with having success in the draft as well, which they hope to continue that this year. We had Adam Kaplan on, like Ramon said earlier today. He also yeah. mentioned something funny because he said, hey, if Ramon Foster was in the room with me as my GM, I'd probably go with the tackle at seven. But he said, I'd actually be interested in taking the best available player if there was an edge at that spot. We've all heard about Dallas Turner, who just uh, worked at Alabama Pro Day. What else do you see out of that position, Coach? Well, Dallas Turner would be the only one that, to me, is a top ten player. You know, as far as the edge in this draft, in this this draft is really rich in in offensive tackles and and receivers, really rich. And when I say rich, I'm talking about going through uh, a, a pretty good line before you have to draw a line as far as as, as skill sets. The edge rushers, you know, not so much. There'll be some spread throughout and there'll be a run on him but Dallas Turner to me is the is the is the very top and then next after him but I would say that, that it, it, there's a separation between he and Jared Verse and so Dallas Turner is 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 the one you'd have you'd have a choice of one in my opinion if if you're picking that high if if that's what you're going to pick would be Dallas Turner offensive tackle wise there's several that you could fit into that slot Coach Dave McGinnis presented by Two Rivers Ford here on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. Coach Mack, we have begun our week-by-week position previews with Rhett Bryan in the draft, and we started with quarterbacks yesterday between Drake May and Jaden Daniels. Who is your number two quarterback behind Caleb Williams? It depends on what kind of offense you're running and what you want to do and how you want to start and start off with I to me just just in watching and, and continuing to watch to watch these guys uh, it, I, I'm a I'm a big Jaden Daniels fan you know I I, I I really am because I think I think the guy has is is really starting to show and did start to show this year you know uh, a lot of a lot of growth and development uh, but I, I like I like Jaden Daniels a lot now to me, Drake May, Drake May will be very successful, you know, in this league because he's had he's had the type of offensive setup that that kind of I mean there was nothing foreign to him as far as being able to uh, you know run a huddle and do and do all of those all of those types of things. To me, to me, the decision the the separation there comes between because you know, I mean Caleb Williams I think going to the Bears uh, you can never say anything 100% sure but I mean the Bears I mean I talked to a lot of people uh, that have been to these pro days and, and with specific questions for them when they you know when they when they call back and report on what's going on and and there's a huge contingent of of, of the of the Bears out there at Caleb Williams and and you know and they had Keenan Allen show up out there too so at, at SC at his pro day, I think it, it's leaning. Everybody's leaning towards that. Though the, the quarterbacks after that, I think it's different. It, it, it's different flavors for different organizations. That's what's going to come out. And the guy that's coming up, the it, not only Drake May and, and Jaden Daniels, but the guy that's coming up, you know, is JJ McCarthy. JJ McCarthy has been on a pretty good rise since uh, you know since this season has been over with. As far as just talking with people. You know, you know, cause, you know, I sit with the different per, uh, uh, coaches at, at the during all the, all week, all week, every minute of the combine in 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 the building, and and just talking with them. I mean, they're not, and they're not trying to say anything, talking about superlatives. They're just saying JJ McCarthy has gotten some pretty solid hits from some people that know what they're talking about as far as liking this quarterback in this draft. So. Uh, it's going to this going to be interesting because and you guys know and we've always said this and it's 100% true and it's even more true in this draft than it ever is has been just because of the talent at those positions that I that I talked about it's going to push some of those guys down because the quarterback draft and the positional draft are two completely separate entities coach mac what do you make of the proposed rule change to eliminate hip drop tackles is this something you've seen more of in recent seasons as higher hits and hits to the head is something the NFL tries to take out of the game. And how hard is it as a coach to coach someone to not have a hip drop tackle and, and eradicate that from the game? Well, I don't think that, that and when they're tackling that they're trying to, that they're saying, I'm going to hip drop this guy. They're just trying to get him on the ground. That's the, that's, the, that, that's the issue. Now, everybody has adapted and has learned to take the head out of it, which I was you know, completely, completely for. Now, I don't think anybody has is is just doing is, and that you know, 
that, you know, they, they took the horse collar out of it and, and they took the horse collar out of it because, you know, again, they were trying to get them on the ground, but again, you can see just, just the way that it works physiologically, how, how it's a danger to the person that, that that's getting, that's getting tackled like that. I don't know how, I mean, it would be, it's going to be very, very subjective. First of all, you know, for the officials to call, uh, but I don't think anybody, nobody is teaching the hip drop tackle. Nobody's teaching that. I think it's just a matter of the speed of the game and they're trying to get them down. Now, I understand, and, and of course, I mean, I, I mean, we've got a back right here that, that, that suffered the consequences of that, and I understand the, the safety of the game. I just, I, I just, this one, this one here will probably, will probably have a lot of discussion on it once they get to the to the owners meeting. Have a lot of discussion as to first of all how how it's going to be officiated, and second of all the coaches are going to say you know you know how do we because as I said it's not something that's being taught it's not something that's being taught it's something that happens in the act of the game uh, just trying to get somebody on the ground especially if you if you're if you if you've been beaten or you're trying to to go horizontally and catch somebody before they they make the edge on you so. To me, that's going to be a very, very nebulous thing as far as uh, they may pass the rule, and if they pass the rule, well, guess what? Everybody will learn defensively not to do it. How wise would it be for Will Levis to immediately get to Florida, Texas, California, or wherever to start throwing to Calvin Ridley and the rest of his receivers? Well, I mean, it's, you know it's probably going on anyway. I mean that's what that's what you do. That's what these guys do now. The way the way things the way things are set up now, and and I mean these 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 guys, they know who's who in the zoo now, and so they they will they they will start they they'll they'll probably start that 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 will go on. And plus, you're talking about Will Levis. I mean, you know, for his development and for his uh, ascension as a quarterback in this league. It, I mean, he's they're, they're putting some pieces. They're putting some pieces around him, and so, and, and I and just watching him, watching him operate this last season, just you know, on, on the field, on the practice field, you know that this guy, Will Levis, will take advantage of everything that's being presented to him because he's dialed in uh, to be the quarterback on this team. He is Coach Dave McGinnis, Titans Radio's head coach, who joins us every Thursday here on Ramon, Kayla, and Will, courtesy of Two Rivers Ford. Coach Mack, thank you as always. Guys, always great talking to you. Have a great day. See you. you yes, sir, Mac. There he is, Coach Dave McGinnis, talking some Titans and NFL draft with us this morning. Coming up, a new way to watch the Olympics this summer, featuring my favorite person in sports media. Next. Mm. Hey, what's going on? It's Will Bowling here for my friends at Lee Company. Hey, if you are a business owner or facility manager, you've got a lot on your plate. You've got a lot to keep up with. And that could include assessing your equipment and systems, evaluating indoor air quality. Maybe you're outlining new cleaning procedures or even reviewing options for implementing touchless plumbing and electrical fixtures. That's a lot. But Lee Company, they're going to help you with it all you hear me talk all the time about how league company is all you need not just for your home but they are also all you need for your facility and they have been in the facility management and maintenance business for decades put their professional expertise to work for you today hvac electrical and plumbing they do it all call league company at 615-567-1000 or contact them online at LeeCompany.com. You're going to love their 24-7, 365 service at Lee Company. 615-567-1000 or online at LeeCompany.com. That's Lee Company, all you need.
Ramon, Kayla, and Will, RKW is brewed by 8th and Rose. Wrap it up, hour number three on the program. Coming up in 15 minutes, Adam Kaplan, NFL insider, joined us earlier this morning and had a very interesting take on what the Titans should do with the number seven overall pick that I have not heard anywhere else yet. 615-737-1045, how you jump in. Streaming live on 104.5 The Zone TV. So NBC Sports this summer, guys, is planning an NFL Red Zone-style whip-around show for the Paris Olympics. And Scott Hansen is going to be the host to open each day. Give me all of this coming up this summer. I am an Olympic nut as it is, and the Summer Olympics are vastly superior to the Winter Olympics. And Scott Hansen hosting it, talk about team handball, and things of that nature and in indoor cycling, give it to me. It's interesting how the Olympics have kind of faded a little after the pandemic. They I have? just feel like, yeah, in my opinion. I can oh, agree I with so. that. I can roll um, with that one. I think yeah. we had that, those it's gap just, years of trying to figure out how mm-hmm. to navigate the next section of it. Well, then we got in four abri- years. But we yeah. got an abbreviated version of it the year after, too. So it wasn't abbreviated. Yeah, it and was you just whatever didn't, it was. You didn't it was hear something. as much about the athletes leading up to it because that's part of the hype is like, okay, this swimmer. Remember Trials. when Michael Phelps was like the guy that you couldn't miss during, you know, every swimming uh lap or whatever the, the races that they do the meters and all that stuff and there was uh what was it Ledecky Ledecky Katie Ledecky, Katie Ledecky. she's still going she's still Is going she really? yeah. yeah oh yeah she's still super but I don't know if they've done a good job of like putting this out there I've seen it like once in a while I'll see the ads for the Paris you know Olympics but I, I want to see more I want them to pump up the gymnasts a little more like what what so, gymnast is like hot and popular still now. Simone Biles and Suni Lee and she took time off though that's what I'm saying back, she took though. that time off right but it just kind of people lost I think they were they don't remember some of these people that were so good I like this though because it does allow me to see more of you know what I want to see the gymnast the swimming and they're doing the whip around thing like I'm all about that I think the only thing that takes away from my constant, I guess the way it's filtered to me is probably lack of cable. I think that's probably one of the things because when I was just having the TV on and stuff like that, I see it more often. But the trials and stuff are going on. I think it's up. I do agree. I feel like it's somewhat faded. Uh, but I'm I get excited for uh, Olympics year. I'm like, well, oh, I'm yeah. a nerd about this. I love the Olympics. You mentioned indoor cycling. I love them. Why, like indoor corner, cycling? Yeah, indoor cycling. A hundred percent. I love <laughs> the high dive. I love the diving. Oh, the I love synchronized great. swimming, which is my side profession that I do in my downtime. If you guys didn't know that. Wow. Um, and I love the shooting, the archery. Love all of that too. So, I mean, the United States has the best sprinter in the world right now, too, going into the Olympics. I did not know and that. And Noah Lyles, who won oh. the world championships last year in the 100 and 200. And we talked about it on this program because he talked about how that's an actual world championship and NBA titles and Super Bowls are not real world championships. Well, he need to go look at the video of Tyreek Cook in the French soccer well, that's <laughs> The French <laughs> cornerback of NFL Europe. Is the best one. Yeah, he, there's a video out of Tyree yeah. Kill going up against a French corner, and it went exactly how you'd expect. All he kept saying is, I'm open. Yeah. Um, so 20, NBA plays, right? Or like the world team for... Yeah. yeah, And they've all committed to it also. Right. I think the, the some of the U.S. guys took it personally the way yep. they got it handed to them in the last FIBA World Cup. You may, I mean, um, isn't there talks of LeBron having like one final yes. Olympics? This is it. Yes, this is it. See, that's going to be awesome. And this might be the last time we see USA dominate. I'm t- I'm telling you. Last time? I, Ramon, go look at what they're – look at the Europeans that are getting drafted and how they have – like, I mean, look at all the European names that have become big stars in the NBA, not Americans. Those are one guy. I'm telling so you. It's coming to the NBA. But, but I'm saying when they get those guys in their countries playing together now against the American-born NBA players, like – I, we got to keep producing over here. These I'm athletes. Pushing back on we got to keep I, pr- I, producing. I'm telling you, though. I know what you're saying as far as saying this. Look at the draft. Got, they've got more prevalence as far as it goes. But the, the the American basketball player, I think, is above the team. Just watch the though. entire teams because all those guys are from Just different watch. countries. As the what is what am I what am I hearing right now? What okay. is this? <laughs> <laughs> Real America. 
You guys think that some other country is going to come into the Olympics and show us what's what? Uh-huh. Heck no. USA, we got the best athletes. We got the best steroids. We got the best ways to cheat. We've been training for this for four years. Oh my you God. think that you're going to stop us? We didn't come here to play school, dang it. That's right. It doesn't matter if it's curling, if it's diving. We're thriving. USA, baby, all the way. They can't stop us. We got why, do you, why do you guys think I want this to happen? I don't want this to happen. Well, I don't I'm think saying, you want it to happen. I'm saying Nobody's look at what's that. happening in the draft. We're seeing these Europeans. And, yes, it's not a country. I understand that. There's different parts of Europe, clearly. Well, yeah, nobody's, but what I'm know. saying is you, you, we got to keep producing those athletes here, get them drafted in, in, in these, you know, higher up in the draft. Like, we got to keep doing our thing with promoting basketball and getting kids to play basketball right here in the U.S. That's all I'm saying. Basketball, I think, is about as healthy as it's been in a while as far as the youth circuit goes. I'll say this to your point. The European players have gotten better. Like, looking at Wemby become a player. Wemby is going to get broken off. He's got to go against the American team in the, in the uh, Olympics, if you're asking me on that one. He's one of one French players. The history has shown yeah. that American NBA players, American basketball players dominate it. And you have a one-off or two every – like, no other team as of late Country has dominated the Olympics when it comes down to it. World Games is different. That watching what Schroeder did last year with Germany, if I'm not mistaken, was different. But you also didn't have premier NBA players playing in it either. I'm just excited to be able to talk track this summer because we got Noah Lyles, Shakari Richardson, Christian Coleman, and Arion Knighton who are about to teach Jamaica what's what this summer. And there's not a dang thing that country can do about it. Shakari going to make a comeback? She she's, won the world championships she's been last on year. Her. I'm, she won I'm the world title to see last year. She can get her get back to yeah. the Jamaicans. They they laughed at her, and a lot of Americans did too. A lot of Americans did like criticize and look at Shikari different. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's been on a a quiet tear as of late. So I'm I want to see her on the world stage do it. And we've got El Saint Pierre, the world champ in the three K. I mean, let me cook on the track stuff this summer. Tell me about the throwers, okay? <laughs> what are the throwers and hammers doing? Ryan okay? Krauser is the uh, world champ, former Texas thrower. Texas. Ryan thrower? Krauser and Joe Kovacs, who the, was coached by my former coach at Tennessee. More impressive with the hammer throwers and 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 shot. Those are puts. shot putters. Shot That's putters. The mm-hmm. hammer, either whichever one is big, strong. The the women's is more impressive to me. It's crazy. It is impressive. I, I, I think gymnastics is the best. Oh, I, I, no think, I think that, huh? those what they show out there in terms of their athleticism is beyond like mind blowing to me. Like the floor roots from the floor routines the to the the beams to everything, the strength that those those young women have, mm-hmm. it's incredible. I want to see the USA dominate. And it is it's awesome to see Simone back after she had she was dealing with some some mental health stuff during the last one. So all I know is the nation of Jamaica is going to hate me, and they're going to hear me this summer. Coming up, <laughs> fourth and final hour of the show. Not really. I probably shouldn't actually say that, considering some of the track meets I have to bro- broadcast on national television. Coming up in a few weeks. Watch it. Uh, Adam Kaplan had some interesting things to say about a number of new Titans, including. A position they could go after at number seven. We'll talk about it next. Hey, it's Kayla Anderson for Members Nutrition. You've heard me talk about the youthful cleanse here over the last month or so. Great time to do that by Daily Defense, of course, but Member Nutrition also bringing you affordable quality supplements uh, Supplements, excuse me, for a fraction of the normal retail cost. And yes, they are made right here in the USA. No matter what type of supplement you're in the market for, let's say it's an immunity supplement, helping you get through, you know, the winter months here that we're almost over with. Weight loss, detox, like I mentioned, with the useful cleanse. You got men's health, women's health, whatever you want in a supplement. Believe me, they have it. And now they are proud of their supplements and excited that they're servicing our listeners. They are offering an extra 50% off purchase of already discounted prices. So you're getting them at a heck of a price right now. No code needed for that. 
The discount is automatically applied once you check out. So go pick your favorite supplements and get them while uh, you can get them because they're going fast. Go now to membersnutrition.com.
What's going on, all you bracket busters out there? 901, good morning from the 1045 The Zone Studios. I am Robert Walsh. Last of the play in games last night as the madness fully enveloped our bodies, grambling over Montana State 88 to 81. Colorado beats Boise State 60 to 53. Both of them go on to the big dance, and the dance starts today. Grab your partners uh, in the West region with Michigan State and Mississippi State at 1115. You can contract all the madness right here on 1045 The Zone. The Vols taking on St. Peter's tonight. At 820. And speaking of the Vols, for those excited about a potential homecoming for Derek Barnett, do not hold your breath as he has signed a one-year deal to return to the Texans in six games with in Houston, compiling two and a half sacks, eight tackles for a loss, and 11 quarterback hits. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and the Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Nine AM in Nashville, kick it off your Thursday morning on Ramon, Kayla, and Will RKW is brewed by Eighth and Roast. With Ramon Foster and Kayla Anderson, Robert Walsh making the show happen behind the glass. I'm Will Bowling. Coming up in twenty minutes as Tennessee begins its trip through the NCAA tournament. Who's the one X factor? We'll play the audio of what Austin Price of Allquest said on that topic Tuesday here on the program, but you can give your take as well in the FN and Bank chat on 104.5 The Zone Television. We'll use its full government name once. Facebook Live, YouTube, Twitter, or Twitch. Twitch, please. <laughs> Boy, that's called a get-off right there. We were man. talking about track, and then uh, like a world-class sprinter out of out the of blocks, the Robert said, bam. Was that like a 1-1, a, a one, one, 10 second split? That was quick. People right? over the line that. like Troy used to. Golly. <laughs> Why do he get so soft, man? Every time I hear him talk now, he's very zen. I don't like that. I want him to be like beating on his chest and like jumping over cashier lines at the grocery store, but he's so zen now. Troy Palomalo, he's always been that way. First time I ever talked to him, he's, hey, your name's Ramon. I was like, hey, yeah, you're Troy. Did he flip his hair when he did that? <laughs> he always hey. kept it in a bun and down when he was off <laughs> the field. Always in a bun. Did he really down. use yeah. um, head and shoulders? I would neither say that or I would not. Because you know you can see what they have in their little lockers. Uh, it's in his locker. I know. It was in his locker. Okay. <laughs> you gave me enough hints. Yeah, it was in okay. his locker. You met luscious hair that yeah. he has with some head and shoulders. Respect I don't have that. very good memories of Troy Palomalu. Oh, oh what man. happened? Dang. It was Tell week. Us. It was week two. <laughs> the year was 2010. Was the quarterback was Kerry Collins. <laughs> I don't need to say anything else. Hey, even we were shocked by that. You, you played in that game, right? <laughs> I played that game. Yeah, it was the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Even yeah. we were shocked by that. You think that's his most famous play? Oh, no. Uh -uh. The one where he dived down and catch the ball underneath yeah. uh, in, oh, in the yeah. snow, um, ran it back for a touchdown. Who team was that? You should know this. <laughs> Oh, I think he they know. know. I see what he's doing they with know. his little, you, you know. little face with his little smiling grin. little mm -hmm. sneaky smile, yeah. Anyway, we were talking about uh, Adam Cowley who came up. Oh, I'm running away from it now. I want to talk you about how zen he is, not about how I he used to dust my team. I don't, I don't, I don't. Yeah, well, now he's zen. He's always been that way, though. If you met Troy in person, you'd think he was, like, soft. He just he's, turned it on on the field. I'm talking about an alien. Yeah. An alien when it comes down to that type of stuff. I've talked to uh, Albert. Hainsworth about that a little bit too how off the field pretty calm like zen dude and then he I was in a conversation with him and he was like but on the field mm -hmm. I would convince myself anything I needed to know in my head mm -hmm. yeah. in order to get into a mode and then I'd get off the field and like oh okay yeah. like it, it's interesting how athletes like that who are so violent on the field can just turn it on or off mentally when they need to. I got two dudes. Jeffrey Simmons is soft-spoken like that. Jeffrey's like that, too. He's soft-spoken. Two yeah. dudes that was just complete maniacs, okay? One is different than the other. The first one is all he want to do is have a ball. All he wants to do is have a ball. John Henderson. But on the field, 
a complete animal. The one person I felt like could look at you, yeah, slap. Slap him in the face. There's only one player, and I never played against him. I played against Big John. There's only one player that I would say on and off the field, you don't know what you're getting mm-hmm. yourself into. On, but, but it's the greatest dude ever, Al Bleepin' Wilson. Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah, it, he was him. Off the field. He was him. Off the field. You Same gonna get the, Still is him. The unfiltered. Yeah. You can tell why he was him. It, 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 and there's others I'm sure I'm forgetting about, right? But I, Alizé, as Ron Slay like to call him, Alizé Wilson <laughs> is probably the only person where people still meet to this day and it's like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Whatever you want. Some, you, you want water? He's that guy. <laughs> like and, you uh, whatever dude. you need. Yeah, whatever and then, you need. And in 1997, at the halftime of the... Tennessee Auburn SEC championship game where Tennessee trailed 20 to 10 at <laughs> halftime. The stories that you hear from everyone on that team about Al Wilson and the conversation, it wasn't really a conversation uh, because it was a one way conversation. The <laughs> speech that Al Wilson gave that Tennessee football team at halftime of the 1997 SEC championship game. Whew, the the fear of God was put into some men in orange at halftime in that game. That's a, that's probably another show or a poll question we got. Who's the athlete yeah. that 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 took you there on and off mm-hmm. the field? Al Wilson's the one. Like Ray Lewis is Alpha. a nice guy. Alpha. You know so, so so Ray is 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 not. You, uh, you get a very personable, cordial okay. person. Okay. What, and Al Wilson's that way too. Yeah. But. Yeah. You, He's still intense, you have, though. You have your reservations of like, <laughs> exactly. Can I go ask him for Jamal Lewis was another one. Yeah, mm-hmm. Jamal has a look on his face. It's like, oh yeah, but those, the, but Al is number one to me. But like, man, True. Mr. Wilson, um, can I sit here, please? <laughs> but he's so he's so freaking cool though. So earlier this morning, Adam Kaplan, NFL insider, joined us, Sirius XM, Fox Sports Radio, and Pro Football Network insider and columnist. We talked to him about the holes still on the Titans roster, the options at number seven. And he brought up a point that I don't think we've discussed at all about edge rusher for the Titans in the first round. If I'm making a call, if I'm turning the card in, I take the edge rusher over the lineman. But I know this. You may disagree with me. If it's your call, it's hard to find edge rushers. Their line is so bad. It, it's got a, it, it, it probably, it, it's, a, it's edge rusher, left tackle. I mean, take your pick. I, how about this one? The best available edge rusher or left tackle there. Whatever, whoever has the highest grade. But see, with, with the run on quarterbacks, is going to be primed that either one of them can be there. Who's, it's beauties in the eye of the beholder, I guess. <laughs> Joe Alt's a stud. There's no question about it. And look, Skronsky's playing inside. They've got two building blocks right now, Skronsky and Cushenberry. That's it. Rand Carthon knows he's, he's been around the game with his father, and, and he's won a lot in his career. He knows the best way to build your football team is with the lines, offensive, defensive lines. That's where it has to start. The Titans still are a long ways away from being a playoff team. If Rand could just do that, just build year to year, going with their offensive line and, and defensive line and edge rushers, then build from the back, then this thing's got a great chance of getting turned around. It's interesting. The idea of edge rusher at number seven. How do you feel about it? Well, I just asked Coach Mack in our interview with yeah. him about that, specifically on at least who's there that's first-round caliber at edge. And he said, honestly, Dallas Turner is the only guy I'd really put up there if you're going to go get a guy in top ten at least. So, I mean, my whole thing is I still think you need to go tackle, and I think he even talked himself out of it in the end of probably go with Joe Alt. But again, you're, but you're right. I mean, defensive line is just as important, and we've seen it getting a little bit weakened. And yeah, they've added parts, but, you know, look at the guys you have right now on the edge. Uh, inconsistency? Is, is that, the? I guess the most important question is to, like you said, it's, it's built as any out of behold. Yeah. It really will turn into that. That's why it's like different departments that vote on it. It's like, who do you like? Who do you like? And mm. then you decide on what's best. For the team, you you just got two foundational pieces on the O line. At least with the D line, you said I got Jeff, I got Harold. Arden steps it up when you need him to. We got to have that production, and then of course you got Rashad Waver, who's in, in a limbo a on what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying in a limbo on what's going to happen. I like the idea of edge. I do think the best way to beat teams is to put their quarterback on his back or flush him out of the pocket. But the two old linemen that he mentioned, of course, is is Cushenberry and then, of course, um, Peter Skoronsky. And that is a huge detriment. 
I think the devil's advocate and the idea of edge rusher at seven is that you are more likely to find a starting tackle in the second round this year more than you are likely to find a starting caliber solid edge rusher in the second round. Yeah. How do you weigh those two positions and their value? Understanding that maybe Arizona tackle Jordan Morgan ends up being an option for you at number 38, whereas the options at edge rusher at number 38 are not going to be near as valuable as Dallas Turner would be at number seven. D- Dallas Turner is the only one I think that uh, that that really justifies that billing, though, right? Yeah, and I you agree. could probably you, get him too. And you got verse out of uh, Florida State. There's a couple other guys that are in this. I know Latu Latu is another guy. Yeah, UCLA that you, that you bring yeah. up, right? But when it comes down to like who's going to effectively like who's immediately going to make plays for you, I think you want someone of a Will Anderson type that ended up getting defensive rookie of the year. Those are the things you're asking for. If you, so the the question to me is. Who's going to have the highest, I guess, trajectory first? And it may end up being Dallas Turner if we're picking between one and the other. A guy that can immediately make an impact based off of his play and ability to get to the quarterback. An offensive lineman does take two, three, four years before they hit that stride. Is Joe Alt there? You said uh, earlier, Will, you had uh, – there was, a, I think, somebody redid their tackle board. Lance Zerline of NFL.com mm-hmm. has J.C. Latham as his number one tackle. Who's more right, though? Who's mostly yeah. a right tackle. It's so hard. The, the closer we get to this conversation uh, – the closer we get to this pick, the harder the conversation it, is getting. On which one is. do you do? – because there, uh, Jordan Morgan is a guy you can yeah. get in the second round. Because it, it is a high, it is a high second round pick, and you just heard Mac again reiterate the fact there's so many guys at the offensive um, tackle position this year. If you really thought um, Dallas was your guy, Dallas Turner, yeah, like maybe you do go and get him. And hey, they were down in Alabama pro day. Uh, Brian Callahan was down there, and they've got plenty of players they're looking at, obviously. But Dallas Turner's probably one of those guys that you at least take a look at. Because you know he's probably going to be there and he's the best at that position. I know we're up against it. I want to continue this one for sure. Okay. Let's do it. As we speak about the importance of one versus the other. All right. Yeah, definitely. 615 737 1045. How would you feel about edge rusher in the first round for the Titans? <laughs> and who's the Vols X Factor as they begin NCAA tournament play tonight? We'll discuss all that next.
Thursday morning, a Friday junior, one might say. Hunter Bone, Kayla, and Will. RKW brewed by 8th and Roast on Twitter, at Ramon Kayla Will. No, we're not calling it X. Edge rusher with the number seven overall pick is our poll we give to the people. You have three options. Sure, only if Joe Alt is gone, or absolutely not. Send in your thoughts there on, or on the phone lines at 615-737-1045. It's interesting. I think the edge rusher option also changes your ideas at corner, right? Because it's easier to play corner in a defense that doesn't have to cover as long. How important is it to pair Jeffrey Simmons up with a young rookie pass rusher of some sort, whether that's on your three down lineman or an edge rusher by trade. Where is that in the Titans remaining off season priorities? I I don't want to out. I don't want to age Jeffrey out. Jeffrey's still young enough that he can see this thing grow, blossom and develop into a monster of a defense again. Right. And I don't think we're, we're as pressed to say, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta, but I think the opportunity to find a guy, the guy, to help him is super important, too. Uh, I think getting Sebastian Joseph Day yesterday was a big deal. Um, and just the young guys that are going to have coming back that, that signed the, the Futures deals, they're still in development. We got to see what they can still do. There were some good things that came out from them last year, but hearing Adam Kaplan drop that nugget on us, and again, this is just a conversation. This ain't law, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody is where we're at with this. I, I got to humble myself and when I say this because I'm all pro lineman. I am. I love being pro, pro lineman. I love it. And the, and the conversation that this team needs a dude, I think is overly obvious. But this is a year in which offensive linemen are coming in abundance, especially the tackles and other positions too. You may end up having, I think we've had conversations, seven or eight linemen going in the first round. That's insane to me. Tackles, I think, is what it was. Not even including if you think Jackson Powers Johnson or Cooper BB or any of the other guards or center combinations going to go. Having Kaplan say he'd be more prone to go get an outside edge guy made me say why. And I've been thinking, that's why I said I want to have this conversation with y'all. I got to be humble in my approach to say, usually take off as a lineman two, three, maybe four years to get to that point to where you say, yes, that's our dude for the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. Like, they play well. They do well. Most of the time when you got a high pedigree guy or you have a situation like a guy like uh, Kevin Dotson that was in Pittsburgh that was pretty much on his way out of the league but goes to the Rams and turns into a $53 million deal over three years. Bam, bam, beautiful. If we're looking for an immediate impact and as far as having a guy that becomes a dude like fast, it's usually defenders that do that. Yep. Defenders are wide receivers, and wide receivers are very de- dependent upon their quarterback play in the offense for those types of dudes. Watching what Will Anderson did this year as far as making a name for himself, I think next year when we do scout meeting Wednesday, we're going to be pointing out Will Anderson. Hey, remember when he did this? Hey, defensive rookie of the year. Yep. Hey, he did that. That is the one position as far as outside edge where you can immediately control everything that goes your way. Now, the production of Dallas Turner has suggested he is a guy that you want on your team that can get to the quarterback, stop the run, and just make splash plays for you. If you're trying to balance out this team as something that we've spoken about as of late, they've gone all offensive for the most part with sprinkles of defensive players in there. Mm-hmm. And the issue that you have to run into also is the quality of those players. I love Harold. Harold has made a Pro Bowl too. But then you look at Arden's situation and say he's still proven. And I think it's fair to say that. He's just inconsistent. And he's still proven. I'd much rather have a guy like Arden be in front of a guy maybe like Dallas Turner and have him come in those spot roles the exact same way that Houston did with Will Anderson. Will Anderson came in from his injuries and stuff like that and played spot rush roles and was very impactful in his approach to it, so much so that he was defensive rookie of the year. We're looking at instant impact uh, and, and just the ability to get the ball back from what Brian Callahan has said to or Denard Wilson. I'm not out of... I, don't count me out of having a conversation of having Dallas Turner be your number seven overall well, pick, be. especially if we believe development is more key for offensive line than actual splash plays because offensive linemen don't make splash plays. I mean, we'd be a boring show if we just sat here and said Joe Alt is the decision at number seven because first and foremost, we don't know that decision. Um, they're obviously evaluating. They're having their top 30 visits, which, by the uh, way, most recently Dallas Turner 
is being uh, reported as visiting the Chicago Bears because I believe they have the pick at number nine right now, um, as well as that top pick. Okay. So, but in this in this day and age, with what you're trying to do against the quarterbacks in your league specifically, in your division specifically, and you're you're looking at the AFC South, okay? You saw what C.J. Stroud did to you last year. You've seen him. I think ascend quicker than we thought he might in his rookie season. I think Trevor uh, Lawrence, while he didn't have the best year, he was dealing with injuries. Um, I feel like he's going to be able to get back on track next year. And then we don't know what Anthony Richardson is yet, but we know he could be something very special just with those quarterbacks alone in your division. I say, do whatever you can to give those quarterbacks hell, give them hell because this is something where you're not going to be able to flip your fingers and say, Will's ready this year. We don't know that yet. So maybe if you have a chance to get a Dallas Turner, who is, if you go look at his film, by the way, I've been looking at some just clips of him, of all these breakdowns specifically, like this guy's a dude. And, and to be able to add somebody like that, I'm not saying that's what they should do. I would not be mad at it, though. Do the moves around the AFC South this offseason help make this decision for you? And by that, I mean, does the Daniil Hunter move for Houston? Will Anderson, Derek Barnett, who goes back on a a one-year deal back to Houston where he finished last season. Do the defensive linemen you've got to see twice a year help make this decision for you? (laughs) Yeah. Because that's the thing is that if Daniil Hunter wasn't a Texan, I'm more inclined to take defense. I'm but the you. fact that these teams have loaded up so much on the defensive front means that I need Will Levis to get through the whole season. Yeah. For I'm me, too. it's uh, forget about affecting the quarterback first. I got to protect my own. That way he can finish the season and have a full game and have a full season's worth of sample size playing against CJ Stroud against Trevor Lawrence and against Anthony Richardson. But, but can you do that with another tackle because you have the king of developing and Bill Callahan? Can the, you risk that? The options is there. And, and and so to me, both of them are can't misses as far as Dallas Turner and, and um, Joe Alt are concerned. It's a matter of Joe Alt is a left tackle mm-hmm. and yeah. still has to develop. I think when you're asking somebody to just go do that thing that they do really well and there's less adjustments to what you're being asked to do, I think you have a bigger splash with a D lineman. So it begs the question, if Joe Alt is gone, what's plan B? Is edge rusher plan B or is the second best tackle plan B? Or trade back. What's your plan B if Joe Alt's not there? If Joe Alt's not there, trade back. With who? Trade back with Minnesota if they want to at that point. How about Um, Denver? Denver is in the conversation. I just don't see the trade market trending towards the Titans having partners. So if that's the case, if Joe Alt's going to give me Dallas Turner. Yep, me too. If Joe's all that's, that's just about as strong of an answer. Yep. If he's going to give me Dallas Turner, I'd mu- much rather believe that a guy in the second or fourth round, because they have no third right now, can develop. If you're, And again, to put the same pressure that the rest of the AFC South is putting on you, going defensive, that also makes sense to me too. Will Levis, like I said, and here's the other thing I think we can't forget too. Brock Callahan has said, too, protection of the quarterback isn't just the big yeah. boys up front. Extension. It's also his play calling. Mm-hmm. Will Levis getting rid of the ball, running backs picking up their blitzes, and staying on schedule as an offense, which has been problematic here. It has been. If you're not in second and 11 every time you get the ball, then you 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 have a better method of operating and protecting your quarterback because the dropbacks are quicker. Plan B for me is trading back to 13 with the Raiders. And taking Olu Fashadu. Plan C is Dallas Turner. I think at that point. I think you are going to have an easier time justifying the Dallas Turner pick at seven than you are a Quinion Mitchell, a Kool-Aid McKinstry, certainly with his Jones fracture and his injury concerns. Although he did run a 4-4-7 yesterday, reportedly at the Alabama Pro Day. But he's wild. still not a number seven overall no. pick, right? Like, no. and, and I don't think at this point you need a wide receiver at seven with Calvin Ridley. Because wide receiver is deep enough for you to go find that elsewhere in the draft. I think if Joe Alt is gone, who is the best available player at number seven? 
And it sounds like that player's probably Dallas Turner. Mm-hmm. Unless one of those three receivers is a guy you feel like fits. Because Roma Dunze, according to many, is the number one, two, or three player in the entire draft, depending on who you read. It's interesting. They, they have got more options <laughs> than I can remember for just one pick. And we say all of that. If Joe Alt is there, then in that context, it's the easiest choice you've made in a draft in a long time. Just like Skronsky was last year. It was. Mm-hmm. It's it's the easiest pick to make, but is it the best one too? And I think when you look at protection, it, it may be the best for your quarterback, but Will Levis also has to prove he's your guy moving forward yeah. too. But to say that from what Adam Kaplan said, you only got two mainstays on this O-line, he was 100% correct. I've always said you need three. They got two. Two in the possible. I don't know if that's Bronsko. I don't know if that's NPF. I don't know if that's Raiders or anybody else that they choose to brought in, bring in. Uh, but they only have two dudes that you truly believe in, and those are your interior guys, and they don't really have the tackle to really be competitive when it comes down right. to what they're going to do week in and week out. Will mentioned everything that Houston got. Heck, you still got Josh Allen. You still got DeForest Buckner. You still got uh, Grover Stewart uh, and, and, um, and, and Andy also on top of the schedule that you're going to have this year. And Pro Football Network's Adam Kaplan, who joined us earlier this morning, polled six NFL executives – who ranked the best moves made in free agency this offseason? Number one, Daniil Hunter to the Texans. Mm-hmm. Sure. They are a problem. They No, they are. It, it, from offense to defense, they're a problem. They're a problem. So really, whatever, you got to do what's best for your team. Like, they're going to do what they're going to do. You're, you've got to do what's best for your team. I think, you, first and foremost, I, I'll just stick with it. I'll stick with Alt. Just sure up that whole side. You got the center from there on that could be good, and then you figure out the other two two spots. I'm and, sticking with them. Yeah. But I'm entertaining But I'm not mad at Dallas Turner. <laughs> Dallas Turner. I'm not right either. Now. I'm not mad at because it. Because you don't, you don't want to be too lopsided on one sure. side. I, I will say uh, production from the DNs, not named Harold, mm-hmm. has to go up. I'm yep. talking about has to go up. It's concerning almost. It is. Yeah, because it could solve a lot of problems you have on defense if you're able to have someone that can tee off on the quarterback right. and make it easier for young corners to step up and be in bigger roles. Or maybe you just get a corner. And I hate to say this. It, it just shows you how far behind the, the, the depth and talent was in the last regime, respectfully. Whether that be injuries or whatever the case may be, it ain't supposed to look like this no. to where you're chasing this bad. Because even Houston walked into better situations as far as their interior. I mean, say what you want to about D'Amico. Yeah. He's got two perennial left tack. I mean, two perennial tackles. Yeah, George Fant and Laramie Tunzel last year. So Which they from, had a yeah. chance to get Fant, but too much money. Brandon and Lebanon, first up on the phones. Go ahead, Brandon. Hey, what's going on, guys? What's up? Much. Much. What up? Hey, I've got one name to give you, Isaiah Wilson. Let's not put all of our baskets or eggs in a basket before they hatch. We know what happens with that first-round pick offensive line, and, you know, we got to dig diligently to make sure that if we do choose Joe Alt, that's the route we go and not making any mistakes. But I do got a question. So we haven't really talked that much about Chig since, you know, the end of last season. And I saw a lot of boards and stuff where they were talking about Brock Bowers and, you know, what kind of illustrations that he would bring to the Titans. So if they're talking so highly about possibly getting Brock Bowers at number seven, like where does that leave Chig? Because I think he just had a sophomore hiccup. So wouldn't you think at some point, because we have a whole new coaching regime, so wouldn't you think at some point in time, like I think Chig is still one of the main guys that we could still use as a good blocking protector and as a good tight end and not have to worry about, are we going to choose Brock Bowers? Are we going to choose this person? You know what I mean? And, mm-hmm. and he's still a good viable weapon as far as receiver goes too, because every time that he had the ball thrown to him, except for a couple of times last year, we had a couple of drops. He ran for multiple yards after yeah. catch with that yak. So I just, want to hear what you guys think about that yep thanks brandon and i think on the isaiah wilson point that's actually in favor of drafting joe alt because mm-hmm. isaiah wilson was selected at number 29 towards the bottom in the 2020 nfl draft and that's maybe even more incentive for you to take the most can't miss prospect mm-hmm. and not settle for someone 
late in the first or early in the second. Yeah. On the Chig question, the reason why we're not talking about him more is because he has to catch the ball when it's thrown to him. Well, and he had too many drops and big moments last season. Well, let me add to that. Because that was something we monitored all last season. Because, yes, he came into his sophomore year with a lot of expectations. A lot of people thinking he was going to take the next step because he was drafted as a versatile player. Like, you were looking at him saying, hey, Chick can do a lot. And I think what happened is he came in, and this is, you know, this is his problem to figure out. I'm not giving an, an excuse for this. But he came in with a lot in his head. And you know, as being a young player in the league, Ramon, players handle things differently. And I think he felt the expectations. I think he felt that weight on his shoulder. And it took him damn well the half of the season to figure out, I got to get out of my own head. And I asked him that midway through the season. Were you in your own head? And he said, yeah. He said, yeah. I, I, I feel like I was in my head when I was going out there and having those drops, which they were significant, the ones he dropped. If you look at the back half of his performance this last season, mm -hmm. you did see the improvement. Now, he's got to now take that to the next level because there's no excuses now. Chig is like the Queen song, Under Pressure, to me. Mm -hmm. He's in the same boat as Arden Key is for me. And I like them both. Uh, both of them Arden's carry, a little older, though. He hasn't figured it but out, the, I feel as like. As far as career-wise goes, making that next step and being like carrying that P-word potential around, some, somewhere, someplace, we have to see it. And that's the issues that I have with those type of things. And I give Chig more grace when it comes down to it. Catching the ball should be a part of your job. You know, like that, that should be it. And he did correct himself. But when it comes down to him taking that next step and being that guy, either he's going to learn this year, you get with it, or he will be gone. Because, again, this is not his coaching. I mean, this is not his, yeah, his his GM that brought him in. Uh, you see everything that he's capable of doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and saying that, you know, the pressure aspect of it, every player has that. Every team has that. Every coach has that. We are just looking for results and focusing in on the main thing. And at all times, the main thing is football when it comes down to players. So he got a, he got a shot. He'll still be make this team, I think. And I do think the Titans tried to use him as someone who's schemed around. And what I mean by that is they were scheming up touches for Chig. Last year, they were running specific plays to get Chigakonko the ball in space. I, I think he will still get that opportunity, but he's got to earn that again now with a new coaching staff. I don't think we're going to see at the start of the season the Titans scheming up specific ways to give the ball to Chigakonko. I think they're going to be scheming up ways to get Calvin Ridley and DeAndre Hopkins open. And if Chig is open in the red zone, if Chig is someone in short yardage, they feel like over the middle is someone that can that can help them, so be it. But I've talked with Kevin Dyson about that and hosting Titans Talk Back, and he said that that's the next step you've got to take as a receiver where, A, you've got to earn your opportunities just being in the offense before the offense can be molded around you. And that's where I think maybe that coaching staff put the cart before the horse last year. They started to scheme things for Chig before he was ready to be the focal point. And they didn't have a lot of options last year. No, Let's they didn't. just be real. No, they didn't. 615-737-1045, the number. Who's the X factor for the Vols in March? We'll talk about it next. It's Ramon Foster for Hill of Plumbing, Heating, Cooling, and Electrical. The month of March isn't just for March Madness. It's also for Hiller's Happy Golden Ticket Sweepstake, okay? At Hiller right now. Enter to win. Simply 
Go to HillerGoldenTicket.com. You're probably asking yourself, well, Ramon, what can I win? All you got to do, number one, is enter your email. You automatically enter to win a, a few things, okay? Prizes include a $5,000 Hiller gift card, a $1,000 Hiller gift card, or be one of 10 Happy Hiller Club memberships that are passed out to you that take care of all of your appliance and, and HVAC and electrical and all your plumbing needs, okay? Or take advantage of the zero interest financing for 48 months on select new HVAC system or 36 months on tankless water heaters and whole home generators. Don't miss out. Enter the win now. Hiller, goldenticket.com.
Wrapping up the show on Ramon, Kayla, and Will RKW, brewed by Eighth and Roast. If you missed our conversation with Adam Kaplan, NFL insider, or if you missed our conversation with Coach Dave McGinnis, you can check those out wherever you download podcasts. Who is your up, biggest upset today, guys, in your bracket? Ooh. Biggest upset today. <laughs> Let me look real quick. I upset see special. Playing today. I was this close. To taking Long Beach State to beat Arizona. I thought about this it too. Oh, because Munson close. had that great presser the other day. Well, just because Arizona's a fraud. But... Have you heard the presser, though? It's yeah, awesome. He's it like, crazy. I don't have to HL answer yesterday. anything I don't have to because I'm not getting paid. Oh, it's just extra he's for... He's just uh... being... Oh, okay. You okay. know, because they're going to... They're He's gone after this tournament. Oh, well. I mean, that does it for itself. You know? <laughs> no doubt about it, man. That wouldn't be a bad one, though. Arizona has not looked great down the stretch, at least. I, I don't think that will happen, but it, if you want to pick an upset, that might be a good one. Mine is McNeese State, 625 this afternoon over Gonzaga. That's, that is my biggest upset today. I don't think there's... I think there's more people picking the upset than there are people pe- picking Gonzaga. So for that reason, I'm picking Gonzaga. There you go. M- mine was, I think, McNeese. Yeah, I'm it sure. It was McNeese. It's a popular one. The NC State, Texas Tech is very interesting. I've got also. that one too. Yeah, I like NC State. NC State, Texas Tech is very interesting. 11 seeds usually beat six seeds. Mm-hmm. Um, the one that's interesting, TK in the FNM Bank chat says, I like Oregon over South Carolina. Uh, that would technically not be an upset because Oregon nope. is favored by a point and a half over South Carolina, which now makes me want to pick South Carolina. It's funny. Uh, y'all jumping on Oregon, the Pac-12 schools down here. I've heard Oregon all over the place of, of beating them. I, I don't, I'm not really a believer in that. I know they just won the Pac-12 tournament, but yeah. they're hot. Yeah, That's I why know. South Carolina is not as hot. And I think South Carolina suggests they got question marks. At yeah. times, like, like can, can they can they score with how Oregon is scoring? Like, I yeah. think when you hit the tournament, you got to take it for what they are. You know what I'm saying? And, and of course, a lot of people will have biases towards the conference that they watch the most, or uh, you know, just just the way you view them. I think March Madness somewhat gives its own measure and stick to it. I picked Oregon because Ken Palm has South Carolina as the luckiest team in college basketball <laughs> this year. They have a luck rating. Based on every shot taken, offensive and defensive efficiency, and uh, what games they should or should not have won based on the way it was played. And they have South Carolina as the number one luckiest team mm. in college basketball. They have Samford as number nine, actually. Another popular upset. Get out. Mm, as lucky. Who is the Tennessee X Factor in March as they take on St. Peter's tonight? X Factor? Dalton? Okay. <laughs> meaning, Meaning... The guy that could go either way that needs to perform well is how I mean X Factor. Because uh, you know what you're getting from Dalton Connect. I think you know what you're getting from Z- Zakai Ziegler. Who's the X Factor beyond those guys? Uh, Ado. Because uh, watching what Mississippi State did to him in Kentucky, why they, how they try to bully him, push him around, I think that's going to be tested. And if they run into Purdue, he's got to be the guy. Uh, I think it make all the sense in the world for him to be the X factor for this squad and, and, and honestly be the driving force behind it. I love her and Bert Bertelkamp, you know, get it in a do like that. That matters. I think in the tournament, if they have to slow it down and the three ball ain't dropping the way they needed or wanted to the way it did in the SEC tournament and against Kentucky. I would say, I mean, I'm not I'm not really joking about Vesky. I know he's not going to be the leading scorer or anything, but I think when they need a three, like he could be counted on mm-hmm. because that's what he's done so well in the past. Like, can he get back to that Vescovi, that confidence, mm-hmm. like insert it in him for this tournament? I'm going to ride with what Valquest's Austin Price said with us earlier this week. Oh, I thought you were going to play it. <laughs> we're going to. I am waiting to play it. Oh, okay. I w- <laughs> Give me one second. I don't know Hit it. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, the the interesting part of tonight's matchup, we'll talk a little bit about St. Peter's. There okay, here you go.
I think that Jordan Ganey has the Lamonte Turner gene. And that's why I say Jordan Ganey is my X factor. Because Santiago Vescovi does not have the clutch gene. Mm. Josiah Jordan James is a good glue guy. I don't think he is going to be the one offensively who can shoot you out of a slump. Santiago Vescovi averaged 5.9 points per game in SEC play. Mm. I am done expecting him to go back to his first team all SEC form when it matters most. Give me the guy that's going to shoot even if he starts 0 for 5. And that's Jordan Ganey to me. He's got the confidence. He has the ability to score uh, in many different ways. You're playing against the St. Peter's team that is ranked 305th in adjusted offensive efficiency this season. They are 76th defensively. The 2022 team that went on a run actually was the number 25 defensive team in college basketball, according to Ken Palm that season. You're going to have to still play up against an in-your-face I can smell what brand of gum you had before the game defense today. And I think Jordan Ganey's ability to score on the perimeter is going to come into question at some point in this tournament, and he's going to have to hit some threes and some open shots. So he's my X factor. I think Tennessee gets it done tonight, but I think it's uh, a little bit uglier perhaps in the first half than uh, we're all going to want it to be. I roll with that. Mm-hmm. I think they get it done also. I don't know if there'll be any crazy upsets tonight oh, is, is where I'm leaning my head at, other than watching to see if McNeese State can be real. If he does, boy, his head coach, their head coach going to be all over the place. Is Vandy fans really entertaining Will Wade? Yes, as yeah, they should they be. Yeah, they are. Absolutely. As, the, as they should be. He is uh, a home run waiting to happen for a guy who has Vandy ties mm-hmm. and Nashville ties and – yeah, he'd be a really good hire for them if Candace Story Lee is willing to put up with the baggage, and I don't know if she is or not. In today's world, is that really baggage? <sighs> I mean, look. Personality-wise, yeah. Yeah, but he's that. he's a good coach, and he's been able. I know there's baggage, but at some point, you've got to start to win games, and I feel like that's their best bet to get him here. Uh, the ba- Well, the, the loud mouth that they had last time was James Franklin. That paid off Did you say the him. loud mouth? That word a lie. <laughs> no, he's a loud mouth for sure. <laughs> yeah, what a lie. Oh, goodness. And we'll I'll wait take at a least. loud mouth. Win some games. We'll wait at least has ties to Vandy that he would have more loyalty to the city and to yeah. the university than James did. James had loyalty to himself. Yes, and he still does. Uh, not a James Franklin fan, obviously. Uh, back at it tomorrow morning. Big show coming up to finish off the week. We have got Brent Hubs. We've got Apple TV's Taylor Twelman going to talk a little soccer with us tomorrow morning. We've got ESPN's Ryan Clark. Get you a show that can do all three. We're going to do all three tomorrow morning. And Ramon Foster is going to give you words of wisdom right now. you got to remember at all times, whether you got a loud mouth or not, your Twitter fingers and your mic is always hot.